um, let me begin the hearing and bang the gavel and let's get underway. Um, again, some housekeeping uh, 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 issues to start with. Uh, the hearing is fully virtual, so we have to address uh, these issues. Uh, for the meeting, the chair or the staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they're not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice when you are recognized that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask the staff to send you a request to unmute yourself. Please then accept that request so you are no longer muted. I remind all witnesses that the five minute clock applies during today's public witness day. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next witness until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. Uh, at one minute remaining, the clock will turn yellow at 30 seconds. Uh, I will gently tap the gavel to remind witnesses that their time has almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next witness. Uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge and thank our ranking member, Tom Cole, for being here this morning, other members of the committee, um, and welcome to the Labor HHS Education Subcommittee's Public Witness Day hearing. Uh, I think we all want to express our deep gratitude to the 24 witnesses testifying today and to all of those who sent written testimonies for the record. It's about your experiences and your testimonies. They are so invaluable to us. The work that we do together to fund the programs in this subcommittee's bill impact the lives of Americans across our country. At last year's Public Witness Day hearing, I said that today's hearing is one of the most important things the committee does. And that has certainly rang true. With the help of public witnesses, we developed a fiscal year 2022 bill that has made transformative investments to tackle America's toughest challenges. Our bill grows educational opportunities with more funding for high poverty schools, for students with disabilities, and for programs that expand access to post-secondary education. It strengthens life-saving biomedical research, increased funding for the NIH. We bolster our public health infrastructure with an increased investment in the CDC and in state and local governments. Tackle the urgent health crisis, maternal health, mental health, gun violence, and substance misuse while reducing unacceptable health disparities. We are supporting middle-class working families with more funding for childcare, for Head Start, for preschool development grants. The bill creates and sustains good paying jobs with investments in job training, apprenticeship programs and worker protection. All of these were made because of input from public witnesses. As we draft the 2023 bill using the president's budget request as a starting point and direct input from stakeholders, including all of you, we will continue to transform the lives of Americans all across the country. Looking forward to your testimony this morning and I thank you uh, all for being here today. And with that, please let me turn it over to our ranking member, uh, Congressman Cole, for any opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for holding this hearing. It's been a while since we've been able to have it due to the pandemic. And uh, I, for one, uh, miss it a great deal. And mm -hmm. I invite those of you that are testifying today to not just show up for your testimony, but if you have the time, listen for a while. And it's, a, it's an education because it'll give you a, uh, uh, a clear idea of the true range of this subcommittee, the diversity of, this, of the topics it deals with, the sheer quantity of requests that we get every year to uh, uh, address specific problems and, or, and to come and testify. Frankly, I don't think there's any other subcommittee that has anything like the number of people that want to come and participate. And it actually underscores something our chair likes to say quite frequently, that this is the people's subcommittee. And in many ways it is, because these are uh, usually urgent issues that uh, affect people's daily lives that uh, we try to uh, direct appropriate uh, money toward uh, ameliorating their circumstances, improving their circumstances and, and generally bettering our society. So. Again, I look forward to today's hearing and uh, for all of you who've come to testify, uh, thank you very much for your interest in the work of the committee and uh, thank you very much for uh, taking some of your time to educate us and our staff about the things that uh, we need to focus on. It's enormously helpful, as the chair said, uh, when we get down to actually putting together the bill. 
So with that, Madam Chair, uh, thank you again for the hearing and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, so we will get uh, get underway with our first witness this morning. That's Bob Lantner, uh, who is the executive director of the California Workforce Association. Mr. Lantner, you're recognized. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman DeLaro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the Labor HHS Education Appropriations and Subcommittee. My name is Bob Lanter, and I serve as the Executive Director of the California Workforce Association. CWA is a statewide nonprofit representing the 45 local boards, as well as a broad coalition of workforce stakeholders in California. My testimony today will focus on the Workforce Innovations and Opportunities Act, Title I programs at the Department of Labor, adult, youth, and dislocated worker. The FY 2023 budget request would increase funding for the adult, youth, and dislocated worker programs to the FY 20 WIOA authorized levels. WIOA Title I should be funded at least to the amounts following. Adult and employment and training activities, 899 million. Youth activities, 963 million. Dislocated worker employment and training activities at 1.6 billion. While we support this proposed increase, we know more is desperately needed to respond to the ongoing impacts of COVID-19 on our nation's economy. The House recently passed a WIOA 2022 reauthorization package that includes historic investments for these programs beginning in FY23, and we strongly support those funding levels moving forward. The federal funding approved through the subcommittee is the primary source that supports a national network of local workforce development boards led by private sector and American job centers throughout each of your respective districts. These centers and their staff serve a critical resource for job seekers, business, training providers, and other agencies to address the economic needs of their communities. We thank the leaders and members of the subcommittee for your efforts during the fiscal year FY 2022 appropriations process, which provided marginal increases about 1% for WIOA Title I programs when compared to FY21 levels. Unfortunately, this level of federal investment does not address our current or future national workforce needs. In California, during the 21 program year, our adult and youth formula allocations were cut by nearly 7% each. 20 other states also experienced cuts to their adult activities uh, during this time. This funding cut during the height of COVID reduce the capacity and services for individuals looking to re-enter the workforce, as well as businesses desperate to hire skilled workers. The labor market remains very fluid with, job, with record job openings and separations and innovative talent pipeline development strategies are needed if we are to support business and provide opportunities to job seekers, particularly those working to achieve economic self-sufficiency. One of the advantages of the federal workforce system is funded by WIOA, is the ability to leverage and engage broad stakeholders such as education and training, business, labor management partnerships, and economic development. Through these networks, federal funds invested locally through workforce boards can be intentionally directed to communities where businesses and, need, and individuals need them most. Unfortunately, the impacts of COVID-19 hit the most vulnerable populations earlier and longer. The effects continue to create significant barriers to employment for minorities, women, disabled individuals, out-of-school youth, ex-offenders and others. Affordable access to childcare, transportation, food and housing often prevent individuals from enrolling in education and training programs or even getting or keeping a job. Uh, this type of support services and additional resources for them will expedite barrier removal. Career pathways are also developed in partnership with business, labor, education to incorporate in-demand skills into program delivery. Collaborations like this lead to better outcomes in job placement, wage gain, and skill development. In California, the High Road Training Partnership Initiative is designed to model sector-based strategies ranging from transportation to healthcare to hospitality. Earlier in this Congress, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was enacted as a landmark achievement to significantly increase spending on traditional projects like roads and bridges but also include broadband expansion and renewable energy sectors. Local boards in California and across the country are leading efforts to identify, train, retrain, and connect workers to these opportunities. The WIO1 Title I programs must be funded beyond current levels to help reach the potential needed in constructing and advancing infrastructure projects by connecting them to our community's vulnerable neighborhoods. In closing, Increased federal investments in WIOA Title I programs will facilitate thousands of successful workforce 
and economic development examples like those referenced earlier. Providing resources that are desperately needed by workforce stakeholders will lead individuals from unemployment and low wage jobs to education and careers, allowing them to become economically self-sufficient and contribute to our nation's economy and the future of America. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, let me start with the ranking member if he has any questions, or I saw Mr. Klein, if he is on. Mr. Cole? I know, uh, Madam Chair, I have no questions. Okay, I think I heard Mr. Fleischman is on. Mr. Fleischman? Madam Chair, no questions, thank you. And uh, Mr. Klein? Uh, no questions, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, I, I, I wanna say a thank you to you, uh, Mr. Lanter. Uh, uh, we all know the benefits of the um, uh, the WIOA programs and how beneficial they are for adults, for youth and the dis disadvantage. One of our uh, issues will be what we uh, will be seeing as a uh, an allocation for the subcommittee that has not yet been determined. Uh, but I think you can rest assured to say that you've seen in, in the past, so while it's not to the levels that you are, uh, you know, that you would like and that we would like, is that we are uh, we understand the value of the programs and uh, our direction is uh, to reinforce these efforts because we know that that's uh, where the, the, for the, the security of the workforce and for the economic security of the people that these programs benefit. So thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate your time thank and you. your testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman. Appreciate it. And now uh, recognized for five minutes uh, 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 as a witness this morning, Jody Grant, uh, who is executive director of the After School Alliance, uh, Washington, DC. Uh, Ms. Grant, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for your outstanding work. Thank you, um, Chairwoman Delora, Ranking Member Cole, members of the committee. It is truly an honor to be before you today. And on behalf of the After School Alliance, the After School Field, families across America, Thank you for increasing funding for the Nita M. Lowy 21st Century Community Learning Centers in fiscal year 2022. It provided vitally important support to after school programs serving 1.6 million kids. We ask you to build on that and help address the vast unmet need for after school programs by providing 1.79 billion in fiscal year 2023. The After School Alliance is a nonprofit that supports more than 23,000 after school partners that are expanding learning opportunities for students nationwide. They keep kids safe and fed and offer them engaging hands on learning experiences that improve school attendance, academic achievement, and graduation rates. During the past two years, COVID-19 presented after-school programs and the students, families, and communities that, they, that rely upon them with enormous challenges. Programs face skyrocketing costs, serious health concerns, limited access to school facilities during closures, staffing shortages, and more. But I am so proud because the after school field rose to meet this challenge. Programs adjusted their schedules to address the urgent needs of children and families by providing meals, caring for children of essential workers all day long, keeping students connected during remote learning, providing safe spaces for online learning and in person enrichment, and so much more. After school programs are now helping young people emerge from the pandemic strong, resilient, and hopeful. None of that would have been possible without federal support. Programs operate before school, during school, during the, I mean, after school, during the summer months, and they provide a safe learning environment, enrichment, caring adults, and mentors. And 21st Century Community Learning Centers are unique because of the collaborations that bring the best of a local community's resources to its students. They offer holistic supports to students of all ages that can prepare them to be college and career ready. Community-based organizations, nationally affiliated nonprofits, colleges, public libraries, parks and rec centers, faith-based institutions, traditional public schools, charter schools, museums, and others are all eligible for 21st Century Community Learning Center funding. But the secret sauce is that all of these entities join together to provide a quality learning experience for pre-K through 12th grade students. 21st century programs are helping students reconnect, 
re-engage and develop the skills they need to be successful, not just in school, but in life. In after school, students discover their passions, be it robotics, gardening, coding, or music, or dance. And at this moment, when so many of our youth are struggling, after school provi programs provide so much more than just academic and career support. They are a safe place where kids can have healthy interactions with each other and caring adults, and most important, a place where they belong. But there are not nearly enough funds. States are able to provide grants for just one in three requests for 21st century funding. Across 10 years, four billion in local grants were denied due to insufficient funding. Before the pandemic, almost 25 million students nationwide were on the after-school wait list. Students who regularly participate in after-school programs improve their school attendance, health-related behaviors, and math and reading achievement. The COVID-19 relief funds you provided are helping students get caught up while providing whole child supports. But too many school districts are using those federal COVID dollars only for academics. Without increased funding for 21st century, students will miss out on the holistic after school and summer opportunities that can help them navigate the challenges created and exacerbated by the pandemic. Additional funding will also help ensure that programs have the resources to address staffing challenges, which is a major and growing concern. And after school and summer learning programs provide a lifeline for working parents and those trying to get back into the workforce. Finally, I wanna end by quoting Kyla Anderson, a high school student attending a 21st century community learning center in Illinois. During the pandemic, I was social distancing and not doing certain activities, but at my 21st century community learning center program, I've been able to meet new friends, communicate and be social with others. I wasn't a talker, but now I am. The mentors helped me stay on top of my work and encouraged me. Without my program, I wouldn't have the grades I do now and I wouldn't be as social as I am. I urge you to increase funding for 21st century community learning centers by $500 million to give more young people like Kyla opportunities to learn and to thrive. Thank you. Madam Chair, I think you're on mute. Got it. Uh, I was just saying, you know, it's always wonderful to hear from you, Ms. Grant. This is a program I think, uh, you, you know, we're all very excited about and named after, you know, one of the uh, uh, titans of the House, this uh, Congresswoman and Chair of this uh, committee, uh, Nita Lowy. And I was so glad you mentioned dance because you know my history okay. of teaching in the after school program of teaching dance and calligraphy. Um, I don't do either one of them at, at, the t <laughs> at this time. So, um, but it is uh, one of the, uh, you, you, you made one point, which I just want to reinforce is just, you said a quality learning experience. And that is what we are talking about here. This is not warehousing children, um, but this is really uh, helping them, teaching them skills, um, enriching uh, their lives. And it also has the added benefit of helping parents uh, who are at work. Uh, so it's a program that is near and dear to all of our hearts. I, I, you know, I, you know, you will keep advocating and we will do our best to, uh, to, uh, to increase the dollars for that. And with that, let me recognize the ranking member. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I just want to quickly associate myself with your remarks. This is actually one of the programs that I think both sides of the aisle really appreciates the quality of the work and the importance uh, of the issue. And as the chair related earlier. Obviously, we don't know where we're at yet in terms of allocations, and there's always lots of needs. But anybody that comes in front of this committee and advocates uh, for a program named after our esteemed former chair has a pretty good chance for success. <laughs> so because we all uh, think so highly of uh, Chair Lowy and uh, miss her a lot. And it uh, wouldn't surprise me if she's watching the proceedings right now. Mm -hmm. She she keeps a pretty close eye on what we do. But again, thank you uh, for coming before us and advocating for such a worthy cause. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Fleischman. Uh, Jody, thank you so much for the presentation and I'll just associate my comments with our distinguished chair and ranking member. Thank you. Thank you. Congressman Klein. Congressman Klein, any questions? No, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. 
Um, then, uh, you know, again, uh, Jody, thank you very, very much. Uh, and thank you for your enormous commitment to this, uh, to this effort. Uh, uh, you have just, uh, over the years, just been such a cheerleader for one of the best things that we do at the federal level. So thanks very, very much for being with us today. Thank you for all your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, a pleasure for me to uh, uh, recognize Mark Jenkins. Um, Mark is the founder and executive director of the Connecticut Harm Reduction Alliance and a United States uh, Air Force veteran. For the past 24 years, Mr. Jenkins has worked to deliver uh, innovative prevention and interventions to the most vulnerable members across the state of Connecticut. Uh, his work has made him a well-respected individual in his field, known for his connections with folks on the street and in the service of community. Wonderful to have you with us today, Mark, to discuss responding to the overdose crisis, supporting harm reduction and syringe services programs through the infectious diseases and the opioid epidemic program at the Centers for Disease Control uh, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, Mark, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman DeLaro, Ranking Member Cole, members of the subcommittee. Again, my name is Mark Jenkins, and I'm a service-connected disabled veteran of the U.S. Air Force and founder and executive director of the Connecticut Harm Reduction Alliance. Today, I'm pleased to submit testimony on behalf of the Alliance and as a member of a larger coalition of public health, HIV, viral hepatitis, and harm reduction organiza organizations. First, I would like to thank the subcommittee for the fiscal year 22 funding increase for the CDC's infectious diseases and opioid epidemic program. New funds will help to strengthen services to prevent overdose deaths and infectious diseases transmissions. I'm here today to urge you to provide $150 million for the program in fiscal year 23. Such funding would expand access to overdose prevention and syringe services programs or SSPs, which save lives and connect people urgently to needed care, including treatment for substance use disorders. Founded in 2014, the Connecticut Harm Reduction Alliance offers a wide range of services to help people who use drugs avoid overdose and live longer, healthier lives. We meet folks where they're at in their time, place, language, and lived experience. Services we provide include syringe services programs to help prevent HIV, viral hepatitis, endocarditis, which is a heart infection, and other infectious diseases. Naloxone, a drug that reverses opioid overdose and overdose prevention trainings. HIV and hepatitis C screenings, shelter, housing referrals, COVID vaccinations, and referrals and transport to treatment for substance use disorders. We reach, you know, quite a lot of individuals. And last year we engaged approximately 3,500 participants, distributed over 4,200 doses of naloxone and saved lives, many lives, reversing over 300 overdoses. Our staff works to build relationships based on trust and not judgmental respect. In Connecticut, there were 1,550 deaths due to overdose in the year 2021, an 11%, 11.9% increase over 2020. This is a 20% higher increase than the nation's over the same period. The US overdose crisis is a true public health emergency where nearly 108,000 people died last year from overdose, a 74% increase over 2015 and deaths continue to rise in 2022. In both Connecticut, and the US, overdose deaths have increased, most among Black people and community of colors. Our work must end these disparities and effectively prevent overdose deaths. Now, sadly, because of this crisis, both nationally and in Connecticut, we have insufficient access to syringe service programs. The Alliance has become the state's largest distributor of sterile syringes, yet demand has outpaced supply especially since funding for SSPs in Connecticut has remained the same while demand for life-saving services has skyrocketed. The CDC's Infectious Diseases and Opioid Prevention Program is the ideal place for Congress to appropriate funding 
to expand access to SSPs and prevent overdose. CDC is the nation's expert on SSPs, and with additional funding, it, can, it could expand access to these critical services. In fact, new recipients of SSP services are five times more likely to reach and enter drug treatment. Studies also confirm that SSPs do not increase illicit, illicit drug use or crime, and that they save both lives and money. Now, while Congress has you know, funded drug prevention and treatment programs until recently, almost no federal funding supported programs that work directly with people that use drugs to help reduce the harms. On April 6th, I celebrated 25 years free from the act of chaotic use of substance, substances that separated me from my family and community. Today, I'm a well-respected, productive member of my community as a result of these very services. I ask that you consider the work that really needs to be done in allowing these services to come forward. I thank you so much for your time and consideration of this urgent request. And please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. Well, thank you so much for a powerful testimony uh, here. And um, I wanna say one, thank you for your, your military service and for your commitment uh, you know, to our country and, and of, of giving back uh, in so many ways. And you are in the business of, 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 of sa saving lives. I think we all uh, know what the, this opioid crisis has meant for this country. We also, um, you know, we've been, COVID has kind of taken a little bit away from, you, you know, the uh, a front burner of the opioid uh, a, a, a crisis as well, but that is something that we have to pay attention to. And um, uh, when you quote numbers, 108,000 people died from overdose in 2021. It's up 10 percent. It's really pretty, you know, ex extraordinary. And thank you for talking about the uh, syringe services program uh, and uh, how, ben how beneficial it is. Uh, you talk about hepatitis C. Uh, it's really one of the uh, the the um, uh, rates, as you pointed out, have have increased in terms of infectious diseases. And I was at the uh, Center for Disease Control last Friday. One of the issues that we brought up and talking about how we uh, try to do something about it. And it would appear that that's what your efforts are about. And uh, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for that. We appreciate your testimony. And you will be sure, uh, be sure that we will give every consideration uh, to, uh, to, to your efforts in uh, hoping to increase uh, you know, the resources that you need to be able to succeed. Congressman Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanna join you in thanking Mr. Jenkins for his service in uniform, but also uh, um, suggesting that perhaps the service uh, Mr. Jenkins you're doing now may be even more important than that. Uh, and we appreciate it uh, more than I can say. You know, I, this is a problem I know the chair and I have wrestled with uh, for many years. And, uh, you know, we seemed, we had 20 straight years of increase in deaths by overdoses back in the late teens. And, all, and then we plateaued and it actually started to come down and we got hit by COVID. And uh, we've seen an explosion since then. I think driven by the social isolation, partly, with COVID, also, frankly, the explosion of illegal drugs coming across our southern border. Uh, and so the problem has exacerbated itself during these last uh, two years, uh, two and a half years, uh, I think more than any of us anticipated. So uh, this is something, again, I know uh, the chair cares deeply about. Every member of the committee on both sides of the aisle cares deeply about because we see it in our own communities. So I'm, I'm I'm sure, again, we always wrestle with uh, more need than money, uh, and that's just uh, the nature of appropriations, particularly in this area. But I can assure you that both sides of the aisle will be interested in working together to see what we can do uh, to uh, uh, help you and others like you that are in the field really saving lives. Uh, and uh, uh, just again, thank you very much for uh, the work that, that you're doing, the service that you've given, but certainly the work that you're doing each and every day right now. It, it makes a big difference. And if we can find a way to help you, we will. With that, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back to you. Thank you. 
Uh, uh, Congressman Fleischman. Madam Chair, thank you, uh, Mr. Jenkins. I just want to thank you and wish you every continued professional and personal success, sir. Thanks. Thank you. I'm now pleased to introduce Jane Weintraub uh, and for uh, your testimony uh, with the American Association for Dental, Oral, and Craniofacial Research. Uh, and uh, you are, uh, and also I might add, Dean of the uh, um, Professor of Dental Public Health and former Dean of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the Adams School of, De uh, of Dentistry. Uh, Ms. Weintraub, you're recognized for five minutes. Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the American Association for Dental, Oral, and Craniofacial Research. AADOCR represents more than 3,100 individual and 100 institutional members in the United States. Our mission is to drive dental, oral, and craniofacial research to advance the health and well being of Americans. I currently serve as president of the AADOCR. I'm also a professor and former dean at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Adams School of Dentistry, and an adjunct professor at the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health. For fiscal year 2023, we are seeking at least $540 million for the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research and a total of $49 billion for NIH's base budget. Despite NIDCR's impressive research agenda and scientific accomplishments, the federal government's annual investment in this institute has not kept pace with biomedical inflation nor overall funding increases for NIH. Funding of at least 540 million in fiscal year 2023 would help bring NIDCR funding into alignment with the overall NIH appropriation and allow NIDCR to build on its myriad successes in its mission to improve dental, oral, and craniofacial health. Investments in NIDCR funded research over the past three quarters of a century have led to improvements in oral health for millions of Americans and continue to show promise in areas encompassing the prevention of dental caries or tooth decay, periodontal gum disease, new diagnostic methods of oral and dental conditions, regenerative medicine, oral cancer prevention and treatment, and in assessing the efficacy of an HPV vaccine for oral and pharyngeal cancers. I cannot emphasize enough how integral oral health is to our overall health. Poor oral health can affect many activities that may be taken for granted, including the ability to eat, drink, swallow, smile, speak, and maintain proper nutrition. Poor oral health also creates an economic burden that disproportionately harms older adults, low-income, and under-resourced communities. The oral cavity serves as a window into many health issues, including but not limited to systemic diseases such as diabetes, HIV AIDS, and Sjogren's autoimmune disease. Researchers are exploring the debilitating lack of salivary function and resulting dry mouth from radiation treatment for head and neck cancers, common medications, and even aging. The NIDCR played a critical role in responding to the COVID-19 public health crisis, funding approximately 3.9 million in high impact coronavirus research. The Institute's research into minimizing infection risk in dental offices, the use of biosensors to detect SARS-CoV-2 in saliva, the role of periodontal disease and COVID-19 complications, and exploring how the virus gets into the mouth and saliva all play a critical role in combating COVID-19. ADOCR is grateful for the investments Congress has made in the NIDCR, which have allowed the Institute to build its data repository and registry in several disease and research areas to meet the increasing need for open source data sharing. The Institute is also poised to make significant strides in addressing public health burdens related to pain management and the opioid crisis. 
Pain associated with dental and oral facial conditions leads to school and work absences, costly emergency room visits and hospitalizations, all of which have a detrimental impact on our economy. Early childhood caries can be very painful for young children and often need to be treated in a hospital operating room and expensive procedure. As a benefit of funding from NIDCR, I had the opportunity to conduct a randomized clinical trial that tested and demonstrated the efficacy of fluoride varnish in preventing early childhood caries. This easy, low-cost method has since become a standard of care to help prevent this disease. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to testify and thank the subcommittee for its support of biomedical and dental research so that all Americans can enjoy good oral and overall health. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, let me ask the ranking member if he has any questions. No questions, but just a quick comment uh, to Dr. Weintraub. As I'm sure you probably know, uh, uh, your profession is pretty ably represented on our full committee by uh, Mike Simpson from Idaho. So I can assure you, you have a, uh, the chairwoman will hear uh, directly from Mike, and you, you have a very strong advocate and somebody that's, again, widely respected on both sides of the aisle. And, and I must add, not in a political, recently won his primary. I was grateful for that. So he's likely to be back here for the next two years as well. But uh, uh, again, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Congressman Fleischman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weintraub. This is wonderful. Uh, my personal friend and a great Tennessean, Dr. Jeannie Beauchamp, is the president of the pediatric dentists, but we've worked uh, na nationwide, but we've worked very closely with dentists across the board. So thank you for your commitment to your profession and for this. And years ago, I was on the board of FACES in Chattanooga, which was a nonprofit dedicated to uh, helping craniofacial actually surgeries and, and fund those. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. And, and, and again, uh, my, my thanks to you, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Weintraub. Uh, you, 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 you make the point um, uh, about how important the research is. And uh, especially, I think, since we're not covering dental care uh, these days and so forth. So what the work that you do is particularly uh, important. And uh, uh, it, 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 I also, in reading your testimony, uh, talk about your interest in ARPA-H and, and NIH, but we're going to try as we will to balance uh, the two in terms of doing traditional research uh, and then looking at the Institute, which you point out, uh, to see, uh, uh, you, you know, in, in essence, how it has been funded over the last several years. One of the things we're going to try to do with a hearing in the fall is we had one set of institutes come in uh, to uh, uh, provide testimony to us on budget, but we're going to try to get uh, additional uh, of, of the institutes uh, to, uh, to, to to come in, including the uh, 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 Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, and hear from them about what the update is uh, in research. We are, you, you know, really in your debt for your for your work, and uh, uh, and it's it's often been interesting to me that we seem to divide the body up. There's the head and then there's from the neck down. And uh, unfortunately we don't pay enough attention to you know, the neck up. Uh, and uh, thank you for being an advocate for all of this and we'll do the best we can to try to address your, your concerns and your resource concerns as well. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, it really is a, a very, very much like to welcome Dr. Marwan Haddad. Uh, he is here in his capacity as chair of the HIV Medicine Association, but I'm so proud to say he's also a medical director of the Center for Key Populations for Community Health Center, uh, Incorporated, one of the largest community health centers in the nation, uh, based in Middletown, Connecticut, uh, which is in my district. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haddad, for your work to serve our community. Uh, particularly with those who live with HIV, with hepatitis C, LGBTQ uh, individuals, especially during the pandemic. Uh, that really underscored for all of us the critical need for integrated and comprehensive uh, health care. Uh, happy to 
hear from you and you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Uh, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for your invitation. Again, my name is Dr. Marwan Haddad, and I serve as the medical director of the Center for Key Populations at Community Health Center, Inc., or CHC, in Middletown, Connecticut, uh, one of the largest federally qualified health centers in the state. I am pleased to testify today on behalf of the HIV Medicine Association of the Infectious Diseases Society of America as the chair of the board of directors. HIVMA represents more than 5,000 physicians and other healthcare professionals around the country on the front lines of the HIV epidemic. Uh, first, thank you for the increase in federal funding in fiscal year 2022 for a number of HIV programs, including the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative and several parts of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. More than two years into the COVID-19 pandemic, it has taken a very hard toll on many people with HIV and populations at risk for HIV. So increasing the demand for HIV-related services, substance use disorder and mental health treatment, and services to address a rise in housing and food insecurity. As we continue to work to control and mitigate the impact of COVID-19, we must accelerate progress towards ending HIV as an epidemic by increasing federal investments in HIV prevention, care, research, and supportive services. Now, when we talk about funding, things can become abstract. And we don't always make the connection to the impact the funding has on people. So I will share with you the story of a patient who I just saw last week um, to bring to light the importance and intersectionality of the programs under the subcommittee's jurisdiction. This man started to see me seven years ago seeking treatment for his opioid use disorder. I learned quickly that he had HIV, hepatitis C, mental health disorders, including depression and PTSD with several past suicide attempts, and was currently unhoused because his partner kicked him out for having HIV. He lost the support of his family after they found out he was gay. He tried shelters, but because he was constantly stigmatized and harassed, he preferred to live under the bridge. Over the years, we have kept him engaged in care, more on than off, uh, treated him with HIV medication, and despite his housing instability and substance use, he continues to be virologically suppressed meaning his viral HIV viral levels is so low, he cannot transmit it sexually to others. If it was not for the HIV case managers, our recovery care coordinators and other key services, we would have lost him to follow up. And while it took years, he's finally housed for the first time since I met him. He continues to experience food insecurity, but is looking for a job and optimistic about getting rehired by a previous employer. I cannot emphasize enough how this story and so many stories like his highlights the importance and value of investing in the programs under the subcommittee's jurisdiction and how this investment directly and positively impacts their lives. So to meet the goal of the bipartisan ending the HIV epidemic initiative of reducing new HIV infections by 90% over the next decade, this will require an investment of at least $850 million in new funding. In addition, increased funding for the Ryan White program in fiscal year 2023 across all parts is needed to ensure access to effective HIV care and treatment nationwide and for programs to be able to respond to the increased demand for services due to the COVID-19 pandemic. For fiscal year 2023, we specifically recommend a $25.5 million increase for part C of the program. CHC has relied on Ryan White program funding to provide HIV care to underserved populations for 23 years across Connecticut. And during that time, the needs of our patients have grown more complex. In 2021, we saw an increase in patients with HIV unlike any increase we have previously seen. 88% of new patients had at least one clinical comorbidity, 62% reported unmet mental health needs, 56% reported food and housing insecurity. Now, unlike HIV care and treatment, there are currently very limited resources to support access to pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP for individuals who are uninsured or underinsured. Although PrEP is highly effective at preventing HIV infections, only 25% of the 1.2 million individuals who could benefit from PrEP have been prescribed it. Among populations heavily impacted by HIV, only 9% of Black individuals who could benefit from PrEP received a prescription in 2022 on only 16% of Hispanic and Latino individuals. We had two patients in the last year, both individuals of color who would have benefited from PrEP, but instead acquired HIV prior to reaching us and while trying to access PrEP services. 
HOVMA in partnership with PrEP for All, the Federal AIDS Policy Partnership, AIDS Budget and Appropriations Coalition, and HIV Prevention uh, Action Coalition is urging $400 million in funding for 2023 for a new national PrEP program within the CDC Division of HIV Prevention. Finally, I urge $150 million in funding for the CDC to address the infectious disease consequences of the opioid epidemic, including through improved surveillance and monitoring and supporting and expanding access to syringe services program, harm reduction and overdose prevention. Thank you for your time and consideration of these requests and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hedden. Thank you for your commitment to the, to the work that you're doing. It's really very extraordinary. I think it just points to the fact that um, how valuable these programs are. We have programs here. What we need to do is to uh, make sure that we are investing the resources that we need to, you know, to begin to, uh, um, uh, you know, address the concerns. I'm happy to say that, that, you know, this committee on a bipartisan basis has, uh, you know, uh, looking to ending, you, you, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a HIV and uh, working uh, you know, with the president's initiative and, uh, you know, we've, we've come together and it's so promising. And, uh, you, you, you know, again, I think most of the folks here today and clearly in your case, you're here saving lives. So we're very, very grateful for that and, and the quality of the programs and the, the uh, results of what you are doing just uh, um, uh, is inspirational to all of us. And, you, you know, gives us the incentive to look at where we can go for the where we can go for the future, and obviously, you know that depends a lot on what the uh, what the, the funds that are available. But we certainly know the the relevance, important, and the critical nature of of all that you're doing. So, thank you, Congressman Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I just want to quickly associate myself with your remarks. Uh, I think you summed it up uh, from a bipartisan perspective about as well as we can. And doctor, we'd love to put you out of business. Uh, right. And <laughs> if there was a way, but uh, we, we would at the stroke of a pen. But thank you for what you do, uh, not just for your specialty, but also more broadly, the whole community health uh, center movement has honestly been transformative in my state. Uh, I know 20 years ago when I got to Congress, I think we only had five of the centers in the state. We have about 60 now, uh, it's made an enormous difference in the quality of health care for uh, folks that, frankly, are right at the fringes and quite often not able to get it. So I appreciate what you and your colleagues do uh, to help all of us in our respective states and districts. So with that, Madam Chair, you yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fleischman. Thank you, Dr. Haddad. And uh, my sentiments... Uh, exactly with the chair and, and the ranking member. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Cynthia McCarran, uh, the uh, association board chair of the association, uh, American Association of the Colleges of Nurses. Uh, and Dr. McCarran, uh, your testimony, uh, we'd love to hear it and you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, or AACN. I am Dr. Cynthia McCurran, and I'm chair of AACN's Board of Directors, and I'm also dean and professor at the University of Michigan Flint School of Nursing. On behalf of more than 850 AACN member schools, which educate more than 565,000 students and employ more than 52,000 faculty across the country. I would like to personally thank you for your leadership and continued support of nursing education, our workforce and research, especially during these unprecedented times. As we work to combat current public health challenges and prepare for the future, AACN, along with 58 members of our Nursing Community Coalition, request at least $530 million for the Title VIII Nursing Workforce Development Programs and at least $210 million for the National Institute of Nursing Research or NINR in the fiscal year 2023. From the classroom to the front line, we have all witnessed how critical a well-educated nursing workforce is to providing high quality healthcare 
While AACN saw student enrollment in entry-level baccalaureate nursing programs increase by 3.3% in 2021, we also saw enrollment decline in our baccalaureate degree completion programs and our graduate programs at the master's and PhD levels. As we look to the future and the need for increased enrollments to support the healthcare demands of the nation, it is important to recognize that more than one, more than 91,000 qualified applications, not unique applicants, were not accepted at schools of nursing nationwide in 2021 alone. This is in part due to insufficient clinical placement sites, inadequate numbers of faculty and preceptors and classroom space, as well as budget cuts. That is why federal funding for nursing education and our Title VIII programs is so important we must support our nursing schools, faculty, and students. As a leader in nursing education, I have witnessed firsthand the benefits Title VIII funding provides. From supporting graduate education for nurses who work and live in rural and underserved areas, to training for sexual assault nurse examiners critical in our urban and rural areas, and promoting diversity within the profession by providing grants to students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Title VIII nursing workforce development programs have been and will continue to be a short and long-term success story and must be provided with funding levels that reflect the population they serve. As we prepare the next generation of nurses and the faculty who educate them, we must also support the evidence that guides their practice. As one of the 27 institutes and centers at the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute for Nursing Research, or NINR, funds nurse scientists who work collaboratively with other health professionals to generate and translate new findings and lead translational research that helps address health equity and the social determinants of health. Bold investments in Title VIII nursing workforce development programs and NINR are imperative, not only as we confront existing health challenges, but as we provide tomorrow's equitable and innovative healthcare solutions. Therefore, AACN respectfully requests support in fiscal year 2023 of at least $530 million for the Title VIII nursing workforce development programs and at least $210 million for the National Institute of Nursing Research. Together, we believe we can ensure that such investments will promote and improve healthcare in America. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, um, and um, my own experience with nursing profession was some 30 years ago and diagnosed with ovarian cancer and spent a fair amount of time in the hospital. And while I can applaud the surgeons and their great work and helping to save my life, uh, it was the nurses who came every day and who just by one look at me could tell whether you know, it was a good day or a bad day and they were always there. So we know the nature of the profession. We also are very conscious uh, of, um, well, my view, and I'll just be frank about it, I don't think the, uh, the Institute of Nursing Research uh, uh, gets, as, gets enough funding as I believe it should, and we'll take a very, very hard, uh, hard look at that. Um, uh, I also know that there's a very big high uh, a debt, uh, a, a student debt uh, for folks going through the nursing program. So loan repayment is another critically important uh, effort and uh, you have so many nurses who are ready to retire uh, that looking at the profession, what we need to do is seriously think about how we are really going to uh, 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 strengthen uh, uh, and nursing and because we know the role that they play, that they play, but the critical role that they played during the pandemic. So you can be sure we're gonna take a hard look at this. Congressman Paul. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, as in this and so many other areas, we certainly don't disagree. Uh, I know in my own state, a number of years ago, under our former Governor Fallon, uh, we did a, a survey of critical needs in our workforce. This is pre-COVID. Number one was skilled nursing, mm -hmm. uh, literally. And, uh, you know, having 
uh, dealt with, and as we all have, uh, uh, all my providers during this really critical time, I know how we stretch the nursing workforce and how difficult it's been for hospitals to get to what they need and how tough it's been on people in the profession uh, who've worked really, really hard. And frankly, how intense now uh, the competition is, not just within states, but across state borders to try and get that workforce, all of which just reinforces uh, the request that you've made. And so uh, just thank you and your profession for what you do selflessly. And uh, again, these are uh, these, these are needed skills. Uh, they're not, not going to go away. And these are important investments. And again, as the chair always points out, we don't know what our money is now, but uh, I can't imagine you won't rank high on the, the uh, areas that we all agree on the committee we need to focus on. So thank you for your testimony. Feel back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Congressman Fleischman. Thank you again, Madam Chair uh, and Ranking Member Cole for your comments. Uh, I would like to say this, um, in my great state of Tennessee, we have several great colleges of nursing and I have spoken with these students. Uh, they are, they are, it takes a special person to be a nurse, uh, but there is boundless optimism with the students uh, that we are producing in our state. Uh, so thank you for what you're doing. So critically needed and uh, very important. So I wish you continued success. And, and again, this is one of the areas of broad agreement uh, on this subcommittee. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, let me now uh, re recognize um, our, our next uh, 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 guest. And that's Dr. Julie and hoping I pronounce this right. Ojinkia, um, and thank you, and Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer um, with, uh, with the uh, APIA Scholars. Um, and uh, 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 Dr. Ojinkia, please, we'd love to hear from you. Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Julia Ojinkia, and I am the Senior Vice President of APIA Scholars, as you just mentioned. We're in an organization that's focused on dramatically improving the educational outcomes of underserved Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander students by ensuring access to affordable college opportunities and student success programming. And I'm also a professor of government with Cornell's Brooks School of Public Policy. Thank you for inviting me to submit testimony for fiscal year 23 appropriations on behalf of the Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions otherwise known as the on a PC program and the students that it serves, specifically asking for an increase in funding for on a PCs to $100 million annually, which would allow them to be funded at a per institution and per student level commensurate with other minority serving institutions. I would first like to begin by thanking all of you for your commitment that you have shown to A and HPI students by increasing spending for the on a PC program in fiscal year 2022. You all made a significant down payment for these schools and institutions by more than doubling funding for ANA PCs compared to the prior fiscal year, from 5 million to more than 10 million. This increase in funding will allow more ANA PCs to better serve first generation and low income ANHPI students in higher education. Indeed, nearly half of ANHPI students attend ANA PCs. And these colleges and universities enroll and serve about three quarters of all low income ANHPI students. Given that the ANHPI population was the fastest growing racial group in the US over the past decade, better serving these students is in the interest of the entire nation at large. Today, we would like to build upon that down payment and are requesting that you increase funding for ANA PCs to 100 million annually which again would allow them to be funded at a per institution and per student level commensurate with other MSIs, like Hispanic serving institutions. Ideally, this appropriation would be divided as $30 million in discretionary funding under Title III Part A and $70 million in mandatory funding for Title III Part F for a total of 100 million in on a PC program funding for fiscal year 2023. This critical division would address the need for additional mandatory funding given current statutory barriers that limit the amount of discretionary funding on a PCs can receive if they also serve students from other underserved populations. This funding is critical because of the impact on a PCs have on the students they serve. 
particularly because many of these students are the first in their families to go to college, come from low income backgrounds, are often English language learners, and are dealing with higher rates of unmet mental health needs, particularly due to the spike in anti-Asian hate our communities have endured during the pandemic. We often hear from our network of students that they appreciate their on a PC programs, understanding their identities and how it shapes their college experience. For example, Christine Jan C. Espinoza, a proud on a PC alum from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, shared how attending an on a PC was a critical opportunity to be mentored by ANHP at faculty and encouraged to pursue further graduate education. Espinoza, now a doctoral student at another on a PC, UNLV, focused on researching MSIs and cherished how she felt like she belonged on campus by being around students who looked like her, learning from ANHPI mentors, and appreciated how even the physical campus environment reflected cultural elements she was familiar with. De Anza College, an institution located in Cupertino, California, with ANHPI students comprising nearly 40% of the total enrollment, provides another instructive example. De Anza used their on a PC grant to pair developmental English with an ANHPI literature course, including wraparound supports with an embedded counselor. Research then showed that the students who participated in this program passed their developmental course at a higher rate, were more, more likely to transition from developmental to college level English, and were more likely to earn associate's degrees all in less time. With increased funding, more institutions would be able to serve their students like De Anza College has. We are requesting this funding increase because ANA PCs have been chronically underfunded since their establishment, and until last year were the lowest funded categories of MSIs per capita. Disappointingly, while 165 institutions have been identified by the Department of Education as eligible ANA PCs, only 30 of those institutions receive ANA PC funding. Equitable funding of all 165 eligible ANA PCs at the same level of HSIs would require an annual funding amount of $100 million. I want to make clear, however, that any increase in on a PC funding should not come at the expense of other MSIs. Thank you for your continued support for the on a PC program, and we look forward to continuing to work alongside you and be a resource for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. GQ. Um, you make a very, very strong case uh, for the relevance, first of all, of the, of the the education, the climate in which uh, these, uh, 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 the hate climate in which, you, you know, people have been living and that's, you know, particularly focused on, you know, Asian, you know, Pacific um, Islanders in, in, the, in the last little while. Um, but it's the, it's the uh, opportunity for education that is critical. We understand that on this committee in a bipartisan way and how we need to make, uh, that, that opportunity available because we know that education is that great equalizer, uh, gives people that, you know, the credentials for success. Uh, and so, and your, your statistics, uh, which we'll take a hard look at, uh, you know, uh, how you describe the underfunding of, of, of the uh, educational opportunities uh, for um, uh, on a PC uh, is, uh, uh, is a pretty, you know, very, very strong case. So we will take a very hard look at how we are able to increase the educational opportunities um, uh, and um, make it possible for uh, um, more to be able to get the kind of education that they need in order to succeed and to have our, our country succeed and our economy succeed. So uh, with that, let me recognize our um, ranking member. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, again, I think the committee on a bipartisan basis recognizes the importance of the request and, and the significance that uh, these types of institutions play, quite frankly. Uh, you know, and Congress has a long history all the way back to the founding of Howard University of recognizing there are uh, unique institutions that serve, you know, specific communities that uh, all of the, the broader community then benefit from over time. And certainly in my area, we have both HBCs and tribal colleges and universities, and uh, these things are enormously important to us. Uh, so uh, again, I associate myself with the chair. We'll give it a hard look and uh, uh, see what we can do. With that, yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Fleischman. 
thank the doctor for her testimony and, and for shedding light on this important issue. And I will yield back. Thank you. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, offer a very, very warm welcome uh, to former constituents, uh, Brian Wallach. He is the co-founder of IMALS and received his bachelor's degree from Yale University. Brian is joined by his wife, Sandra uh, Bravaya, who like me grew up in the city of New Haven. Uh, a few years ago, while Mr. Wallach was working as an assistant US attorney, he, is, he was diagnosed with ALS, just 37 years old. Refusing to let this shocking diagnosis deter him, Brian partnered with Sandra to co-found IMALS. It's a nonprofit organization that provides critical support and resources to ALS patients, caregivers, and loved ones. While engaging with policymakers, they promote ALS research, they mobilize communities uh, to, to take action in this area, to spread the word to, it, for increased awareness of ALS to, to millions of, of people. Um, uh, Brian Wallach uh, is a force and a force along with Sandra um, and so delighted to have him with us today. He is going to talk about funding for ALS research programs and some of the new initiatives that will help to accelerate development of therapies for all life-threatening neurodegenerative uh, diseases. Um, with our hearts and our arms open, we welcome uh, Brian and Sandra Wallach. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman, for that introduction and that background. Uh, we're so grateful to be here today with everybody. And thank you to you and to Ranking Member Cole and to Congressman Fleischman for the opportunity to speak to you once again about the fight to end ALS. My name is Brian Wallach. I am 41 years old and I have been living with ALS for almost five years now. I am here today with my wife, Sandra, who is my voice. <laughs> Truth be told, when I first testified before you in 2019, I did not think that I would be alive to speak to you today. <laughs> I am one of the lucky ones, as 90% of those diagnosed in the same year as me are dead. That includes veterans, mothers, sons, and daughters from every single congressional district. Thanks to you and the other amazing champions on the Hill, we have made real progress since I first testified before you. And you have worked to pass and fund the act for ALS and have recognized that ALS should be part of the mission of the new ARPA-H. Three years ago, you told me that you would do everything in your power to fight for a cure. And Chairwoman, you have kept that promise. For that, I am humbled. But we still have miles to go before we rest. May is ALS Awareness Month in the US. On May 12th, I am ALS and hundreds of ALS advocates gathered in DC a mile away from the Capitol to plant thousands of flags for those living with ALS and those we have lost. This is the reality of ALS today. My name was on one of those flags. For me, my reality is that I can now barely speak. I am mostly confined to a wheelchair and I can no longer raise my arm. But I am still here and I will keep fighting for as long as I breathe. By passing Act for ALS, Congress and President Biden made clear that the FDA and NIH must act now to implement these programs. Most importantly, the Expanded Access Grant Program. As President Biden said during the December signing ceremony of the bill, quote, this law invests 100 million annually for the next five years. And this includes issuing grants that support research on and access to promising new therapies for patients who don't make it into clinical trials. This means hope 
for patients who would otherwise have no access to treatments that could possibly work for them, end quote. Earlier this year, you approved and appropriated $25 million to make this program real. And on May 12th, NINDS released the funding opportunity announcement for those funds. I am here today to ask you to build upon this momentum by fully funding ACT for ALS for the 2023 fiscal year. Fully funding Act for ALS means that we need to appropriate 100 million in fiscal year 2023, including 75 million for the expanded access grant program. This funding is not only desperately, desperately needed by those of us who are dying from ALS right now, but it will also change the course of ALS forever. Full funding will allow NINDS and FDA to move forward aggressively and quickly to implement the programs in Act for ALS. We urge the agencies to work with the same urgency as Congress has shown so that we can make the hope that Act for ALS embodies for those who have suffered in the shadows and those who have been left to die for too long real. The ALS community, which includes clinicians, clinical researchers, people living with and impacted by ALS and advocacy organizations, we are all united in support of expanded access programs. As NIH and FDA create and execute on the expanded access grant program mandated by Act for ALS, we ask the agencies to incorporate the set of recommendations the ALS community provided to them this month. I also ask for your support in ensuring that ALS research is robustly supported by NIH and by the Department of Defense. These research programs are critical to unlocking treatments for ALS as well as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis and beyond because all of these neurodegenerative diseases are connected. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. The path toward ending ALS is clearer. Mm -hmm. But there is much more work ahead. On behalf of the ALS community, thank you. And I look forward to working with you to turn ALS from always fatal to chronic and then to end it once and for all. Thank you, Chairwoman. To you, Brian, and to Sandra, you both always are uh, such a great inspiration to all of us. And I, uh, Congressman Cole will comment, Congressman Fleischman and other members of the committee, even though they are, uh, they may not be present, but your, your efforts are beyond inspirational. That is not adequate. Uh, you have, um, you have made ALS and the ravages of ALS, not only on the individual with the disease, but on the families as well, on your family. But you have opened the eyes of this country. You've opened the eyes of members of Congress to what our responsibilities are. And, you know, I look at you, Brian, and, you know, we, we've had a chance to talk, you know, on several occasions. And I said to you on our last conversation, you're looking good, my friend. <laughs> you're looking as good as I have ever seen you. And I know you, you know, there's, there, there's treatment. And I'm going to tell you that we are not going to stop fighting. We are not going to stop fighting because, you know, you're not going to let us <laughs> and we're not going to do it because you are that wind beneath our wings uh, here. And we listen to you and it gives us great uh, courage to look at the dollars that we spend and where we spend them and know that while we have conquered other illnesses in this great country of ours, because we have great medical facilities, that we have the opportunity, as you have said, to make it chronic uh, and to deal with ending. And we will continue that research. And I promise you, 
uh, that we will uh, that, that 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 we will do that. And uh, we have in the language of ARPA H that one of the neurodegenerative illnesses which they will look at is ALS. Um, I was at an event last evening where I met, and I'm trying to remember his last name. First name was Roger, and I talked to Roger about you, Brian, and 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 Sandra. He is six years diagnosis. He was at this event last night in a tuxedo and, you know, just enjoying it and so forth. Still, you know, ravaged by the illness, but on his feet. And, you know, so there is hope that is out there. And uh, we all cannot thank you for never, ever, ever giving up hope and making sure that we never give up hope as well. Love you both and thank you for what you have done in calling attention to this ravaging disease. We're there, we're there for you, my dear friend. Congressman Cole. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Brian and Sandra. Thank you, that was an extraordinary uh, statement and uh, your advocacy is, is quite frankly inspiring and amazing and, uh, and makes a difference. Uh, and for you to take the tragedy that's uh, fallen into your lives and turn it into something where you can help others uh, is really remarkably commendable. Uh, you know, we talk a lot in Congress about the differences and, and get covered, but there are lots of things that Chair and I work together on. And uh, we haven't, in, you know, together in seven years, we've increased NIH funding by 49% and uh, tried to look at some of these things uh, uh, you know, as not one shot wonders, but sustained commitment over time uh, that makes a difference. Um, ALS certainly affects my office. My chief of staff, uh, uh, father has it, uh, my district director's husband uh, as well. So um, uh, it's something. And uh, Sandra, I particularly was uh, pleased to hear you talk broadly about neurodegenerative diseases. My wife has MS. I lost my dad to Alzheimer's. So these things touch all of our lives. And, uh, you know, I, I'll make this remark often. Um, I never had anybody at a town meeting come up to me and say, you know, you guys are just spending too much on cancer and ALS and Alzheimer's. And, you know, they might be worried overall about the budget. These are actually the places where the American people want us to be making continual investments. Uh, and because they see the difference and uh, you know, they see the impact on their loved ones, their friends, their associates. They want to be part of the solution. They want us uh, to, to write the check uh, that provides hope and services and, uh, you know, hopefully someday puts uh, some of these things, as we have some things, in the rearview mirror, so to speak, uh, where they're not uh, threatening people's lives. So, again, I want to commend you for your advocacy. Uh, Brian, I want to wish you the very, very best. Uh, God bless you for beating the odds. You clearly have a fighting spirit. And uh, we'll continue to walk with you guys uh, step by step, uh, because as the chair said, uh, this is a commitment we all believe in very, very deeply uh, and a cause that uh, we all want to continue to work on going forward together. With that, Madam Chair, yield back. Congressman Fleischman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Cole. Um, Sandra and Brian, we have seen uh, very uh, astute, wonderful presentations today uh, across the spectrum of this great subcommittee. But your, uh, your presentation today was truly the most inspirational and, and outstanding. And um, I do thank the chair and the ranking member for their very strong statements and support. Um, I am a lawyer like you, sir, uh, and uh, still keep my law license up. Uh, we have... Uh, had many folks with ALS come into our office over the years. Uh, and I will say this, uh, like you, they are great fighters and they are committed to seeing a cure for this uh, horrific disease. So we wish you every success. And again, thank you for being an inspiration to uh, so many folks who are afflicted with this. And uh, again, the chair and the ranking member are absolutely right. We put these resources uh, into this uh, area and the American people support this. Uh, and this is what we, we ought to be doing in Congress. So thank you. Just one final word to 
Sandra, to you and to you, Brian, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, the, the media reports that people in this country believe that um, the uh, members of Congress who serve on different sides of the aisle, in different communities, that they cannot lock arms and uh, look at the challenges uh, that face this country, look at the challenges that people face. And uh, it's not true. We do lock arms. We do have our differences, but we understand the nature of the challenge that you face and that everyone with an ALS diagnosis or one of the other neurodegenerative diseases or so forth. And in this area, I proudly say that we come together, we have come together to provide the resources that are necessary in order for us to continue the research, to look for that discovery, to cure, to allow people to be hopeful about what their future uh, is and what it can be. And the two of you, again, your strength, your determination uh, really uh, pushes us forward uh, to make sure that we are uh, working with you and that you are not alone. So thank you. Thank you for being here today and for testifying. God bless you both. Thank you so much for your incredible words. And we look forward to building a better world together with you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Let me now recognize um, Dr. Karen Knudsen, Chief Executive, uh, Chief Executive Officer uh, for the, um, uh, 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 the American Cancer Society, and that's the American Cancer Society, uh, 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 C-A-M, uh, the Cancer Action Network. So Karen, thank you. I had the opportunity to meet with um, Lisa this week and, and folks, and uh, anxious to hear your testimony. Uh, so much appreciative of your being here. Thank you so much for having me. And I just like to say for Brian and Sandra, you know, absolutely in incredible testimony. And I, I hear you and want to pick up on that theme of the importance of research. So I am Dr. Karen Knudsen. I'm the CEO of the American Cancer Society. We are the largest nonprofit funder of cancer research outside the US government. As we meet here today, one in three men and one in two women over their lifetime will hear the words, you have cancer. But we are also at an unprecedented time in history where discoveries have been converted into meaningful progress in cancer prevention, detection, treatment, and even in some cases, cure. Since 1991, when there was a formidable increase in cancer research from the US government and from the American Cancer Society, we have declined cancer mortality rates by 32%, resulting in more than 3.5 million deaths averted from cancer due to cancer research funding. It is clear that cancer research does indeed save lives and more than ever before that gap between discovery and clinical intervention has narrowed. And that has emboldened an entirely new generation of cancer researchers to strive for better anti-cancer strategies. Just in the last 10 years alone, we have witnessed an entirely new class of cancer therapeutics in the form of immunotherapy. Research also resulted in the development of a highly effective cancer vaccine, something we sought for a long time against HPV driven cancers. And thanks to that breakthrough, right now in this country, we have the first generation of individuals vaccinated in the US who will have protection against cervical cancer and up to 50% of head and neck cancers that we heard about earlier today. And similar impactful research advances have been realized in this progress against 200 diseases that we call cancer. It is due to research that this cancer mortality rate is declining and on this basis, it is that we ask Congress to not only maintain, but increase the pace of discovery through enhancing cancer research funding. Despite our gains, we have much work yet yeah, to do. A subset of lethal cancers are now on the rise and show concerning trends that do require research, including 
unexplained increases in early onset colorectal cancer and in advanced prostate cancer, just to name two. Lung cancer remains a major challenge, accounting for 350 deaths of Americans every day. At present, cancer remains the second leading cause of, of death in the United States, with more than 600,000 individuals predicted to die from cancer this year alone in the US. The scientific community, I would opine, has shown again and again that the investment in cancer research yields returns in lives saved and is poised to increase the pace of discovery. Now, equally important is investment to re to, in research to mitigate disparities in cancer outcomes. Right now, black men have a two-fold higher death rate for pro from prostate cancer, stomach cancer, and myeloma as compared to whites. Black women have a 41% higher death rate from breast cancer as compared to their white counterparts. Geographical disparities also exist. Lung cancer mortality is three to five times higher in Kentucky versus Utah or Puerto Rico. Cervical cancer is twice as high in Arkansas versus Vermont. Research is needed to help develop strategies such that all Americans will have an equal chance to prevent, detect, and survive cancer, an ideal to which the American Cancer Society also strives. An essential component of this work will also include access to clinical trials, which we all know in cancer is the most advanced form of care. Trial funding through the NCI is a vital resource through which Americans across the country benefit from research breakthroughs that can be life-saving. We believe that investment in cancer research is a critical component of in, the, in the investment of the health of US citizens and the population as a whole. Our progress has been remarkable and the US scientific community stands ready to accelerate. So on behalf of the 1.9 million Americans who will be diagnosed with cancer this year alone, we urge the following three recommendations. First, funding of 49 billion for the NIH and FY23 to allow the base budget to keep pace with biomedical research and development price indices and to provide meaningful growth. Second, a critical inclusion must be at least 7.76 billion for the National Cancer Institute. Given this explosion in impactful discoveries, NCI is experiencing a demand for cancer research funding that is far beyond any other institute or center. Grant success rate from the NCI dropped from 13.7% in 2013 to now just above 11% in 2019. This situation is unique to the NCI. At a time when cancer researchers are making historic advances in new treatments and therapies, and by contrast, the success rate for the whole of NIH during that period actually rose. Third, and lastly, we'd ask for $462.6 million in funding for the CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control, as they provide key resources to states and communities to prevent cancer by ensuring that at-risk low-income countries, communities have access to prevention programs. So I'll stop there. I thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Dr. Knudsen. Uh, I also might add that in our meeting this past week, my meeting with uh, some of your some of your folks, you have a extraordinary nationwide network of 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 of, of, of folks who are, are out there, you know, advocating, uh, you know, for you know for what you are advocating for uh, uh, today. So I want to compliment you on on on, on that effort. Uh, we did have a hearing not that long ago with a number of the institutes from the NIH and the NCI uh, was there. I'm proud to say overall, I think over the last several years on the bipartisan basis, this, this committee has uh, you, you know, provided about $11 billion uh, to, the, uh, to the NIH in terms of NCI last year, we did uh, $352 million. Uh, we also very much aware at that, at that hearing about the success rate, the grants, et cetera, and uh, you know, a concern uh, about that, but you know, you're the second, uh, um, second to the federal government and what you do by way of research. It's clear that while we've made some great uh, uh, strides and particularly exciting about cervical cancer because that's an area which, I mean, we can conquer cervical cancer. There's some that will take us many, many more years to deal with what we can do that and, and we're, 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 we are on the road to doing that. And um, uh, when you speak about the increases in lung cancer and prostate cancer, it's, it's very, very, very troubling. And then the health disparities, 
Uh, I think if anything, with the pandemic, we've known about disparities, but I think what the pandemic has highlighted is those health disparities uh, uh, in a whole variety of ways. And uh, we are committed uh, in this committee uh, to uh, addressing these needs. Our issue was always what, what is the allocation, how much of the resources that we have, but you can be sure uh, that when it comes to this basic research, and I'll just say one more thing, we were all troubled um, uh, and we made this known that, you know, the uh, $274 million um, uh, to NIH uh, in this budget versus $4 billion to ARPA-H, and we're for ARPA-H and doing what they need to do, but we're going to create that balance uh, as we move forward and, and uh, as we put the bill together. So thank you so much for being here today and for your advocacy and for the great strength of your national organization. Thank you. Congressman Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Knutson, thank you for being here. That was a, a very powerful and effective uh, presentation. Uh, look, this is something, of course, you're very fortunate uh, Maybe our chair is not, but you have a committee chaired by a survivor of cervical cancer. So uh, we have an intimate knowledge here, uh, sadly at the expense of our chair, but uh, we're, we're happy she's here. Um, look, I couldn't agree more with, uh, science moves at very uneven pace uh, across very multidisciplines, and the opportunity for cancer is now. There's just no question about it. Uh, and the success rates that you point to shows how much good science we're leaving on the table, so to speak, uh, and how tough the decisions are. Uh, the folks we tasked with picking between which grant to fund and, and which one not to, probably more difficult in your field than any other uh, right now uh, in research. So again, this uh, committee has worked really hard over the last uh, seven years uh, at, at bolstering NIH. I want to again associate myself with my friend, the chair's remarks about uh, what we both see as the imbalance between ARPA-H and NIH funding and the president's proposal. Uh, we both support ARPA-H. We put a billion dollars there. Some of our colleagues might even have questioned us doing that uh, because we didn't yet have the format, the director, what have you. I, I know my Chair is aware of this. We evidently had good bipartisan progress from energy and commerce a couple of weeks ago coming together to give us a framework. But again, we want to work with the president on that. We know it's a top priority of his, but it can't happen at the expense of uh, our ongoing commitment to, to NIH. Uh, and uh, again, we, uh, both the chair and I, recognize how unusual the opportunity in front of us here is. Uh, if we can, um, you know, find a way to make the commitment. So uh, she has a lot of tough decisions to make. We always do uh, on this committee. Uh, but uh, I suspect uh, we will continue the tradition of doing well by the NIH. Again, that's something that we're not only committed to, but our two colleagues on the other side of the aisle or other side of the rotunda uh, in uh, Senator Murray and uh, Senator Blunt uh, are, have been extraordinarily helpful in this run of seven years uh, that we've had of sustained increases above inflation for NIH. And zeroing in on this, uh, this cancer opportunity, I think, uh, is really something uh, we need to, to give every possible consideration support for. So thank you for the work that you and the American Cancer uh, Society do and have done for many, many years. Uh, thank you for the advocacy. It's really important. Uh, but I, again, I want to underscore the point you made so eloquently. Uh, you got to seize the moment sometimes. And this is a moment uh, in time where I think if we can find the resources, uh, the kind of progress we can make that you spoke of, I mean, investment does make a difference. We do have people living longer and uh, we have saved lives. This is, you can measure it demonstrably. So, uh, there's not very many cases where we've got this direct a relationship between what we appropriate and the difference we make in the lives of the American people. So again, thank you for what you do. Thank you for your advocacy. And uh, we look forward to, uh, and continuing to work with you and the American Cancer Society on a bipartisan basis going forward. Feel back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Congressman Flashman. Thank you again, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Cole. Dr. Knudsen, uh, one of the nice things about being an appropriator and of course serving on this distinguished subcommittee is we touch so many different areas and it gives us as members an opportunity 
to learn an awful lot. And since I've been in Congress, uh, I've been involved with the Cancer Caucus. Your group has done a tremendous job. But I do want to uh, call out specifically Dr. Jordan Berlin and his team at Vanderbilt. Whenever I have cancer questions uh, mm -hmm. with difficult cancers, we've made so many wonderful strides, but there are still some cancers out there, some types of lung cancer, some types of summit cancers yeah. and the like that, that are yeah. still baffling. So the key again is investment in, 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 uh, in, in research and continued progress but together we are making this type uh, of progress. So thank you for your advocacy. Uh, and, and again, this is gonna be one of these areas where there is gonna be really unanimity. Uh, this this is not, shouldn't be an issue for appropriators, for Republicans, Democrats, or authorizers. This should be uh, an all out effort by, by Americans who we represent to, uh, to defeat cancer. So thank you for your advocacy and Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me now recognize Belinda Pettiford, uh, president of the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs. And uh, Ms. Pettiford, uh, you are recognized for five minutes for testimony. Thank you, Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and distinguished subcommittee members. My name is Belinda Pettiford, and I am grateful for this opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs known as AMCHIP. I proudly serve as the board chair and a president of AMCHIP as well as chief of the Women, Infant and Community Wellness Section here in the Division of Public Health for the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. In fiscal year 2023, AMCHIP requests that the subcommittee fund the Title V Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant administered by the Health Resources and Services Administration at $1 billion including a robust increase for the state formula fund. We are thankful to the subcommittee for the increases in funding for the block grant over the past several years and for recognizing the essential role Title V plays in improving the health and well-being of women, children, including those with special health care needs and their families. As you may know, the Title V block grant is driven by evidence, flexibility, and results to ensure access to quality maternal and child health services, reduce infant mortality, maternal mortality, and preventable diseases and conditions, and promote family-centered, community-based, coordinated care for children with special health care needs. The block grant funding is distributed to every state and territory by a formula child to the child poverty rate. Another significant portion of the block grant is awarded through special projects of regional and national significance or SPRANS, which are discretionary grants that support a range of programs, including those to train the next generation of leaders in MCH to support innovation to improve maternal health outcomes and so much more. In order to illustrate the far-reaching impact of Title V, I would like to share a few examples of how the state formula funds are being used in various states. In Florida, the State Maternal Mortality Review Committee identified leading causes of maternal deaths and issued urgent maternal mortality messages to healthcare providers and hospitals around obstetric hemorrhage and hypertensive disorders to prevent future maternal deaths. In Massachusetts, the shift to provide home visiting services in a virtual manner ensured a new mother in crisis was able to get the counseling she needed. As this subcommittee members are aware, our nation is facing an unprecedented shortage of infant formula. Title V agencies around the country have been using their voices as trusted messengers to share critical information with families and healthcare providers about how to obtain formula, as well as to warn of misinformation that has been spreading through this crisis. In North Carolina, we are closely monitoring supply, working with the federal government, with manufacturers and retailers to get more formula on North Carolina shelves. We're sharing information and resources and are working specifically with our Title V MCH partners to share this information with families. During the past two years, Title V funded programs have been at the forefront of COVID-19 response efforts with a particular focus on addressing the unique impacts of the pandemic on maternal and child health populations. The flexible nature of the block grant made it easily deployable source of support for states to respond to the public health emergency. However, while the block grant is the backbone of our nation's public health infrastructure, 
for women, children, and families, that infrastructure has been severely strained as a result of this pandemic. Maternal and child health programs um, and the workforce need sustained increased investment to rebuild, to recover, and best serve the nation's maternal and child health populations now and in the future. Further, our nation has longstanding racial, ethnic, geographic, geographic and social economic inequities in MCH outcomes. While incremental funding increases to the program like the Title V Block Grant make a difference in advancing maternal and child health, to make transformational improvements that finally address these inequities, we will require transformational investments in the block grant and complementary federal programs that support maternal and child health, including CDC Safe Motherhood Portfolio of Programs, HRSA's Healthy Start Program, and CDC Surveillance for Emerging Threats to Mothers and Babies Network. We thank you for funding the Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant at the 747.7 million in fiscal year 2022, and urge you to provide an increase to at least 1 billion in fiscal year 2023, including a robust increase for the state formula fund to ensure that states have the public health foundation they need to support healthy children, healthy families, and healthy communities now and into the future. And I thank you so very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much for your uh, testimony. Uh, I'm, I'll just make some comments, but let me just ask the ranking member uh, if he has comments and questions and follow it up with Congressman Fleischer. I don't, don't have any questions, but I want to thank our witness for her work. Uh, it's really important. I mean, one of, again, as uh, our colleague, Mr. Fleischman said, one of the great things about this committee is you learn a lot uh, because it covers uh, so many areas. And one of the things I was sad to learn, uh, you know, over the course of my service on this committee is how poorly we as a country stack up with other countries uh, in this area in terms of maternal health and then how great the racial disparities are. Something that we, as the chair mentioned earlier in another context, we all knew were there, but the COVID really brought it home. And uh, I know uh, uh, she will focus on this. We will focus on the committee and and do the very best we can. But I want to use this forum to also put out a challenge to some of our friends at the state legislature. I know it, uh, in my state, we don't fund enough uh, in these areas. And we have some of the worst statistics in the country, quite frankly. Uh, and I'm proud of what this committee uh, does, and particularly under the leadership of our chair. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we're putting a lot of money, and uh, I'm always for having a rainy day fund at the state level. I live in a state that uh, is a boom-bust state because of commodity prices and energy and agriculture, and so that's a wise thing. But uh, when times are good and when the federal government has put as much money out for a variety of health care purposes as it has over the last 18 months to deal, I think very appropriately with COVID, some of that money needs to be directed towards some of these programs in terms of matches for what we do and, and what have you. So again, this is an area that of great concern um, and one that uh, I look forward to working with the chair on as, as we move forward. But thank you for working on the front lines in North Carolina on a problem that really ought to embarrass us all as Americans. Uh, we need to do better uh, in maternal and infant health than we're doing. Uh, and uh, thanks for your efforts and thanks for your advocacy and, and, and bringing it here in front of the committee and, and making such an important case uh, for all of us to hear. You're back, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I, I too want to say thank you for the, uh, for the testimony. I, I, I think it's, uh, we've been talking about, you know, uh, you know, seizing the moment. There is such a very uh, big focus and interest on the issue of, of maternal and child health programs. Um, and we need to seize this opportunity uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to further them. It has been really, um, uh, and we have a heavy emphasis even in, in, the, in the 22 appropriations bill, the 2022 appropriations bill, um, uh, great advocacy by so many members of, our, of, our, uh, of, of, of the Congress, our caucus, uh, and so that that is an issue that has been put front and center in so many ways. And uh, that I assure you um, will continue. Um, and, uh, but the advocacy needs to be continued because again, the disparities that, that have been demonstrated and uh, uh, the issue with black women, 
Uh, this is a pretty extraordinary man. Um, oftentimes, we lose track of uh, the serious issues uh, that a childbirth may bring. And uh, people just view that, you know, well, you're going to have a baby, everything's going to be okay. It's fine. It's not the case. It is not the case. My own personal experiences with, you know, my stepdaughter some 17 years ago, we thought everything was fine. And at one point, we almost lost both uh, my granddaughter, who is now 17 years old, though, and, and, and her mom. Uh, and uh, it was harrowing. And we, we, we weren't, we had no idea, you, you know, that this was something that uh, you, you know, could come from a, from a regular pregnancy. So, um, but I just tell you, keep at it, keep at it at this moment because the window is open. The window in Washington shuts very quickly. So just continue the advocacy um, uh, so that we can uh, re really join the ranks of other countries and they're paying attention uh, to health and welfare of, of, of women and children, uh, women's and children's health in this country. So thank you very much for your testimony. All uh, I would like to do is to recognize Dr. Ann Matthews uh, 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 with the Rotary Foundation of Rotary International uh, uh, around the issue of global polio eradication at the CDC. Uh, Dr. Matthews. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Delario, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee. I am here today on behalf of 300,000 members of Rotary Clubs in the United States and to thank you for the committee's generous support and longstanding leadership toward a polio free world and to also encourage continuation of funding to support the polio eradication activities of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We are seeking $276 million in FY23 for CDC's polio eradication efforts to protect the progress achieved to date and to capitalize on unprecedented low levels of virus transmission to end polio once and for all. Rotary International and the CDC are spearheading partners of the GPEI, that's the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, a global partnership launched in 1988, which reaches the most vulnerable children through safe, cost-effective polio immunization. Thanks to this committee's support, polio cases have been reduced by more than 99.9% .9 since 1988. 20 million people have been spared disability and over 900,000 polio related deaths have been averted. Last year, only five cases were, were recorded in the two remaining endemic countries of Pakistan and Afghanistan. This low number of cases reflects a high number of children effectively protected through immunization. Every year, the GPEI works to immunize 370 million children globally. There were also 40% fewer cases of circulating vaccine-derived polio virus in fewer countries in 2021 as compared to 2020. The novel oral polio vaccine type two was introduced in 2021 to accelerate progress in bringing outbreaks under control. This progress is encouraging, but fragile. Earlier this year, a child from Malawi was identified with polio that is genetically linked to virus in Pakistan. And another case has been found in Mozambique. These cases remind us that as long as polio exists anywhere, it is a threat to children everywhere. Now is the time to capitalize on progress to complete polio eradication. CDC's work in critical, is critical to protecting the progress and overcoming remaining challenges. CDC's Atlanta laboratories are key to confirming both the presence and absence of polio virus 
They serve as a global reference center and training facility, providing expertise in virology, diagnostics, and laboratory proceedings. CDC also contributes technical expertise through the international assignment of technical staff to WHO and UNICEF to provide strategic and management expertise to priority countries. They also train and deploy public health professionals to high risk countries through the Stop Transmission of Polio program. The $276 million that Rotary is requesting will ensure that CDC continues to provide this key technical expertise while building country level capacity to maintain high levels of population immunity. This funding would also expand CD's capacity in three critical areas of outbreak response, surveillance, and vaccine procurement. The global network of 145 laboratories and trained personnel established for polio also tracks measles, rubella, yellow fever, meningitis, and other deadly infectious diseases, including COVID-19, and will do so long after polio is eradicated. Our collective investment has already saved $27 billion in health costs since 1988, and it's estimated that investing in polio eradication now may cumulatively save an estimated $33.1 billion by the year 2100 in the form of reduced cost and surveillance and vaccination. We appreciate so much the help you have given and ask that you continue to support the eradication of polio. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for your powerful testimony. Uh, first of all, let me just say that uh, we wanna say thank you to Rotary for the great work that Rotary does in this area and a variety of others that really um, have a, 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 a tremendous network uh, and they bring relief of, uh, you know, all over the United States, but also internationally. So I compliment you and, and, and Rotary. Um, you know, sometimes we think that because there are not that many cases in the U.S. of, of polio that, uh, you know, we tend to forget the rest of the world, but you make an absolutely, you know, brilliant case for what we should do internationally and what we can do, because if we don't conquer it there, we are also at risk here. And I mean, I think that that, that is clear. And, and I just want to, um, I was at the CDC last Friday. Uh, they are a remarkable organization. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, we should do everything that we can uh, to make sure that they can continue in their global efforts overall, because they play such a role internationally. And I know that the Gates Foundation plays a role in this effort uh, uh, as well. So thank you for your advocacy and your um, uh, your aggressive advocacy on this. It, it makes a difference. Thanks very, very much. Congress, uh, Congressman Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to associate myself with uh, your remarks, particularly when it uh, comes to uh, thanking Rotary for what you've done over the years to keep the focus on this disease. I'm old enough to have been part of that first generation of children who uh, got the polio vaccine and grew up, uh, you know, it, it's amazing to me. I don't know that my son uh, has ever met anybody that had a disease. It was very common, as uh, Dr. Matthews know, and my friend, the chair knows when, uh, when I was growing up. Uh, and so you went to school with kids that had suffered the ravages of this disease. And uh, the, the progress we've made is astounding and something that we can be really proud of. Uh, and there's a couple of lessons to draw here, and that's the importance of sustained effort uh, over time, that if we spend the dollars, we really can make an enormous difference. The statistics you cited, Dr. Matthews, in terms of uh, both the financial and much more importantly, the human cost and then savings of the effort that's been made, uh, uh, you know, both uh, by Rotary individually, uh, with all the hard work uh, you've done in, in cooperation with the CDC. So I really do think it's important. This is a genie that can get out of that bottle. Uh, and uh, as my friend, the chair pointed out, uh, we're not safe here until it's eradicated everywhere. And I'd be remiss finally, Madam Chair, if I didn't uh, give a shout out to my old friend, uh, Ralph Monroe, who has yes. been a tireless advocate for Rotary for many years. We were oh, secretaries of state together. 
uh, back in uh, the uh, 1990s. Uh, he's been a tireless advocate, as I know Dr. Matthews knows, Thank been you. up to Washington many times and uh, just embodies, um, you know, the commitment of Rotary as a service organization uh, to do good all over the world. He's traveled all over the world and, right. uh, you know, in, in this cause and in this effort. And again, as, uh, as the doctor knows, uh, uh, we're down to some places that are pretty tough for us to get at geographically, culturally, politically, uh, you name it. But it is really important that this fight be fought to the finish. Uh, so again, thanks for not taking your eye off, off the uh, goal, so to speak, and making sure that our committee, which I think on a bipartisan basis wants to finish this fight too, uh, uh, you know, stays focused on, on this really, really important mission. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Matthews and uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, let me now uh, introduce uh, uh, May Red Painter, uh, National Association of State Long-Term Care Ombuds Programs. Uh, and I would just welcome you. She is a, May Red is a graduate of the University of St. Joseph in West Hartford. Um, and uh, uh, extensive background working to improve the quality of life for residents who need long-term care um, and with critical work uh, with the informed choice process in Connecticut the, in nursing homes. Uh, and she has been an advocate for person-centered uh, 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 care. So Ms. Painter, thank you for your work uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Hello and thank you, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I offer this testimony today on behalf of Connecticut residents in long-term care facilities, as well as in collaboration with the National Association of State Long-Term Care Ombudsman Programs. Some may not know what a long-term care ombudsman is or how the work that we do assists constituents in your community. In every state, ombudsmen work to improve the quality of life and the quality of care for individuals residing in nursing homes, assisted living communities, and in some states, home and community-based service waivers. The individuals that we serve may be your family members, a friend's parent, or even a veteran who served our country. No matter who they are or how they were brought into the long-term care system, there will be an ombudsman there from one of our programs to support them and advocate on their behalf. Ombudsmen respond to complaints, protect rights, and ensure that they are treated as individuals with autonomy, choice, independence, and access to quality health care. We perform all of our activities on behalf of and at the direction of residents while ensuring strict confidentiality. We thank you for the support of our programs, and today we request funding that is directly tied to the need for resources so that state ombudsmen can hire and train additional permanent staff. Increasing the number of ombudsmen will enable us to respond to residents impacted by the pandemic, to meet an increase in demand, and to address the rise in long-term care complaints across our country. Over the past three years, residents have faced a virus that targeted them, and drastic infection control measures that cause them to be isolated. Our offices have received thousands of calls reporting the impact of these restrictions and the calls continue today. Restrictions also paused normal state and federal surveys that ensure the quality of care and investigate complaints. Today, residents are still reporting a lack of access, oversight and accountability. Our program representatives make regular visits to long-term care communities to support residents. In 2020, nationally, we had 1,700 paid staff and approximately 5,100 volunteers. This was a significant drop from the volunteers we had in 2019, and we anticipate a further decline this year. These numbers are not sufficient to provide a regular presence in the 14,000 plus nursing homes, plus thousands of community residents and assisted living facilities. As a result, our representatives have had to do more with less. To do this, we have used COVID relief funding to develop remote outreach, trauma support, and expand our use of technology. Ombudsman greatly appreciate the COVID recovery funding, and without it, we could not have accomplished this critical work. But to, re continue, to continue to respond to this level and meet growing demand for our advocacy, we need to increase stable annual funding to recruit, hire, and train new staff and volunteers. Last year, with eight regional ombudsmen, three support staff, and about four active volunteers, the Connecticut program responded to almost 4,500 complaints, in addition to hundreds of calls for information and consultation. That is almost the same number as at the height of the pandemic, and we do not see things slowing. 
In addition to nursing homes, ombudsmen have been given mandates to serve residents in assisted living, but were never provided regular annual funding to hire staff and appropriately provide protections and outreach. We need dedicated assisted living and home and community-based funding to hire staff and support residents in these settings. But the national funding has not been there, and as a result, our programs have been unable to adequately serve these citizens. Increased regular annual funding will allow us to affect change for individuals as well as at the state, local, and national level. Therefore, let me respectfully request that for 2023, we receive $65 million for assisted living ombudsman services under the Title VII Older Americans Act, $70 million for our current core funding under the Title VII Older Americans Act, and $52.5 million under the Elder Justice Act for training and services and address increasing abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Current funding levels preclude ombudsman programs from quickly responding to complaints and monitoring facilities. Though the funds have been authorized since 2010, to date, no Elder Justice Act funds have been appropriated for ombudsmen in the annual appropriations process. Without our eyes, ears in these facilities, residents are at greater risk of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and any number of other rights violations. Thank you for your consideration of this request, and I welcome any questions. Well, thank you so much, and, and thank you for your testimony today. I think you uh, really uh, ad address an issue that's critically important, one that has been it's, it's, it, it, the role of an ombudsman and, you, you know, what you, you, you can do. Uh, that, the strength of that role has been there, but I think it's what happened with the pandemic uh, is that this was... Uh, you know, it opened up the Pandora's box and people in assisted living, you know, wound up being, uh, as you pointed out, isolated uh, and families without knowledge of what was, you know, going on. And the high rate of deaths within assisted living during the pandemic is extraordinary uh, and really needs to be, be looked at. So your role is, 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 uh, uh, is, is, is critical. Um, and, uh, uh, and we need to recognize that and uh, really take a hard look at what has been the past in terms of funding and see where we can go. Obviously, you know, we have, you know, we have restrictions on the amount of money we have, but the points that you make uh, about the complaints, the abuse, and we did a hearing about a week ago or two weeks ago that pointed up, uh, you know, what's not happening uh, in the elder justice uh, area and the increase in the cases of abuse of 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 of, of, of our seniors, and uh, so that we you, you know want you to have what you need in order to be able to deal uh, with the volume of complaints, but to be able to give our seniors um, and their families the comfort of knowing that they are safe and that we uh, and they have an outlet in which they can make their voices heard as well. So thanks for the testimony. Congressman Cole. Thank you. Uh, I'll just again associate myself with your remarks, Madam Chair. I want to thank Ms. Painter for her work and work of others like her during the COVID uh, outbreak. It's important at all times, but that, that period where that particular population was so much at risk, uh, you know, you, what you and your colleagues did was pretty extraordinary, it saved a lot of lives. So thank you very, very much. And thank you for your testimony. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now let me, um, I'm so, hopefully I get your name right here. Hannah Wesolowski, Chief Advocacy Officer for the National Alliance on Mental uh, Illness. And uh, please uh, proceed with testimony. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, I want to thank you for your bipartisan support and commitment to mental health. NAMI is the nation's largest mental health organization. I am honored to be here today to speak on behalf of people across the country with mental health conditions and their loved ones. The mental health challenges we face as a country are vast and will continue to grow as we recover from and grapple with the effects of the pandemic. If we do not invest in mental health now, we will pay the price for decades to come. Bluntly, our nation is at a breaking point when it comes to mental health. We have an urgent youth mental health crisis, as highlighted by our Surgeon General last year. And just this week, we had another heartbreaking tragedy in a school. This puts immeasurable trauma on not only the children in that community, but kids across the country. 
Add to that the impact of the last two years and our existing mental health crisis, and we're facing an avalanche of need. I urge every member of the subcommittee to think about the children in your life, your kids, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, neighbors. Picture the face of one child in particular. Children like them are crying out for help and we need you to listen. We can make a difference if we act urgently and in a significant way. If not, we are saying we are satisfied with our children suffering in silence with sacrificing their futures. Think back to the face you pictured. Would it be okay if that child had to struggle in silence? There are unprecedented numbers of children experiencing anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. More than half of parents are concerned over their kids' mental well being. During the pandemic, rates of teens visiting the ER after a suicide attempt, especially girls, skyrocketed. And 45% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide in the past year. We do not have to accept this, we can do something. Children spend much of their time in schools, which gives us a chance to intervene early, but we have a severe shortage of counselors, social workers, and psychologists in our school system. The president has proposed $1 billion for the school-based mental health services grant program. This funding is desperately needed to vastly increase the number of mental health professionals helping kids and their families get the help they need. But our crisis doesn't end with children. Nearly two in, a five, two in five adults struggled with their mental health in 2020, compared to about one in five before the pandemic. The Community Mental Health Services Block Grant Program helps our states fill needed gaps to address this growing demand. We urge you to include the president's proposal to increase the block grant to nearly $1.7 billion, funding that is critical to helping people on the ground. While our goal is to help children and adults as early as possible, sadly, NAMI hears every day from desperate families with loved ones in crisis and nowhere to go for help, or from individuals who have fallen through the cracks and are trying to piece their life back together. In seven weeks, 988 will be available as a nationwide hotline for suicide and mental health crises. I applaud Congress for the bipartisan support of this number, and NAMI is deeply grateful to this committee for drastically increasing the investments for the hotline and services that provide a mental health response to people in crisis. But even with those increases, we don't have the funding to help everyone. Just take the call centers that will answer 988 calls. They are often staffed by volunteers. We are asking people to volunteer their time to respond to people calling on the worst day of their lives. While these trained counselors are amazing, we cannot build a sustainable system relying solely on their goodwill. Because of 988, we have a once in a generation opportunity to reimagine how we respond to people in crisis. We cannot miss this chance. Too many lives will be lost or ruined. The call centers that will answer 988 calls rely on a patchwork of inadequate funding. To meet the growing demand, we need to fund not only the National Lifeline Network, but also fund local call centers answering the 988 calls to ensure culturally competent local capacity in every corner of this country. A fully developed crisis response system also requires mobile response teams staffed by mental health professionals and crisis stabilization services. Unfortunately, most people don't have access to these services and people are dying because of it. NAMI is deeply grateful for your leadership in bringing the new mental health crisis response pilot partnership program to our communities. It will spur the availability of mobile crisis teams as the primary in-person response to people in crisis, but the work is not yet done. As you know, there is need for more teams like this to serve both adults and children. We urge you to increase funding of this program to $100 million to help people in more communities across the country. As I wrap up, I need to recognize that I am here today to speak on behalf of the people who cannot be here. The people who are struggling, the parents trying desperately to find help for their kids, and all those who lost their futures because our system routinely falls short. It is imperative that we address this crisis and make mental health among our nation's highest priorities, turning a breaking point into a defining moment. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Let me first and foremost say that uh, NAMI is the gold standard. Thank you for the uh, really the years and years of, of, of work in this area. You are uh, extraordinary in the, uh, in the work that you carry on. Um, you know, the issue is that, that mental health um, it was an issue before the pandemic, uh, under the radar probably, but serious and serious enough to be considered, you know, a crisis. But it didn't, it it it, it didn't manifest itself in a way to those of us who were working on it that we had to deal with this crisis uh, in some way in mental health. So, but the pandemic brought this to light, 
now more than ever, we're looking at people who are struggling um, uh, as a result of so, so many issues uh, that, that, that are out there. It's, it's isolation, uh, uh, you know, it's losing a, a, a parent, a grandparent, a loved one, etc. I don't know how many families have been, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, touched uh, by the loss of someone, you know, with a million lives lost. It's like every family has suffered something somewhere. That has to be addressed in a formidable way. And we have to recognize uh, that we need to, uh, 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 to do that. We're excited about the 988 line. And, and we also wanna make sure that we are providing the resources so that people, uh, it works. So that someone is not dialing the number and there's nobody home at the other end. Uh, so we need to make sure that uh, that is uh, that that is there, uh, and uh, we need to focus as a country on what is a mental health crisis, not specifically caused by a pandemic, but a mental health crisis in this country, uh, exacerbated by that and high suicide rates. And think about it: I saw a little boy this morning uh, who, who was uh, who survived yesterday but he was looking at his friends all around him uh, being killed. And, you know, how do you deal with that child? How do you, you know, help that child uh, to, to succeed? Anyway, thank you so much for your testimony. And uh, uh, we will, uh, this is a high priority. Uh, Congressman Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to thank our witness uh, for being such an effective and thoughtful advocate. Um, you know, um, I remember a number of years ago when uh, when I was chair of this committee and uh, we passed the Cures Act and my friend uh, uh, Tim Murphy, who's no longer sadly in Congress, but is a child psychologist and has become an expert on post-traumatic stress uh, and still stays in touch with me and hey, think about this, think about this program, came by my office as a member who had done a lot of work on uh, adding mental health provisions uh, in that. And uh, I said, this is all great, but the authorizing committee, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad this is all authorized. Sadly, my budget's been cut by $5 billion <laughs> by the budget committee. Now, at the end of the day, uh, and we have to mark up to that number, the chair is going to have this challenge. Uh, at the end of the day, I suspect our overall number will go up uh, as we get to a deal with the Senate and and uh, we're gonna need uh, democratic support and they've got some concerns in these areas that I share. So we'll do a little bit better. But uh, I said, you've got to prioritize this for me a little bit. And he said, well, if you can only do one or two things, the most important thing is to fund the programs that get us more mental health professionals. We simply do not have enough people. And uh, I think uh, your remarks about 988 are illustrative of that. It's uh, partly money, but partly we need to make those investments in the pipeline to make sure that we have the professionals uh, to actually respond to the situation. And this is one where I think uh, we've been slower than any of us would like to get there, but we're starting to begin to understand maybe the pandemic brought it home a little bit more. And you're, you're quite right about that. This committee has had, um, under the chair's leadership, multiple hearings uh, where we've talked about the long-term impact and I, people that were isolated, whether it was in nursing homes or uh, school kids that uh, lost the structure and focus in their life. Uh, uh, so um, um, thank you for, for uh, keeping us focused on this important task. And uh, I'll continue to work with my friend, the chair, and hopefully we can make some progress. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I would like to recognize... Thomas Fleischer, Dr. Fleischer, Executive Vice President of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you. Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the HHS FY23 appropriations. I am Tom Fleischer, Executive Vice President and a former president of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology that I will refer to as Quad AI for the rest of the talk. On behalf of our organization, I'm before the subcommittee today with three requests. A $6.1 million funding increase for the Consortium on Food Allergy Research, also known as COFAR, and supporting report language. 
report language to support education and awareness related to the need for penicillin allergy evaluation in order to delabel non-allergic patients, and third, funding to address antimicrobial resistance. Quad AI wishes to express its appreciation to the subcommittee and to Congress for the passage of the FY22 Omnibus Spending Bill, which provided an additional $3 million to COFAR, increasing its budget to $9.1 million. Food allergies affect 32 million Americans, including 6 million children. Each year, more than 200,000 Americans require emergency medical care for allergic reaction to foods. That's the equivalent of one trip to the emergency room every three minutes. COFAR was established within NIAID in 2005 and has resulted in many advances, including the discovery of genes associated with increased risk for peanut allergy and the most promising potential immunotherapy treatments for egg and peanut allergies. Additional breakthroughs scaled across the other major food allergies could significantly improve the quality of life for tens of millions of patients. The Quad AI and other stakeholders enthusiastically support the $6.1 million funding increase for COFAR in FY23 and accompanying report language as submitted to the subcommittee by representatives Roe, Kana, and Anthony Gonzalez, as well as others. This would bring COFAR's annual budget to $15.2 million. COFAR has been able to accomplish breakthroughs in the under-researched field of food allergies. It is crucial that we continue investing at proportional levels, given the scale of this condition, which impacts eight to 10% of the US population. Further, food allergies disproportionately impact low-income communities of color. But also like to speak to the growing threat of antimicrobial resistance, which combined with the dwindling pipeline of new antibiotics requires policies that prevent inappropriate use of antibiotics. According to the CDC, approximately 10% of the US population self-report being allergic to penicillin Yet nine out of 10 of these patients are not allergic when formally evaluated, meaning fewer than 1% of the population is truly allergic to penicillin. The CDC has cited the importance of correctly identifying truly penicillin allergic patients to decrease the use of broad spectrum antibiotics. To this end, the Quad AI urges the subcommittee to include report language that encourages the CDC and other appropriate federal agencies to undertake physician and patient-directed education to heighten awareness of this important issue. We also support CDC's work in the area of AMR. The Quad AI supports $100 million in funding for the National Healthcare Safety Network and $397 million for the Antibiotic Resistance Solutions Initiative. These programs would benefit from significant new resources to achieve the goals outlined in the National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria. Thank you for your past support of food allergy research, antimicrobial resistance, and penicillin allergy evaluation. We appreciate your consideration of these requests for FY23 and look forward to working with you to advance these important health issues. Thank you very, very much uh, for really, uh, really uh, focused testimony. Uh, uh, here and, and the work that the Academy does, the areas that you have, have uh, uh, outlined uh, for years trying to deal with the issue of antimicrobial resistance uh, and that we need to spend time in trying to, to, you know, to really to deal with it. And it would be interesting to know, given the, the, the vast array of, of antivirals and drugs and antibiotics that have been used throughout COVID here, of what kind of an effect that is going to have for the future. I'm not a scientist, uh, you are and a, a physician to, 
to, to sort that out. So very, very big issue and one that we have, fo we have focused on, on on the committee. Um, uh, 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 secondly, when you talk about um, uh, the food allergy research, really incredible. I don't know if you, at, at some time we'll talk about being lactose intolerant, which I only, it was only several years ago that that occurred and what one does about that. But I watch people all of the time and have family now, my five-year-old grandson, you know, is, uh, is a fish, you know, my God, he gets, you know, deathly ill. Um, so, uh, but the work in that area, I think, uh, um, uh, is, uh, would, I think we can, and again, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist, but we made strides and we can continue to look at this as a way in which we can alleviate that uh, 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 stress, pain, or potentially, you know, uh, you know, death. Um, uh, uh, but that, this can be prevented. We, we can deal with prevention in this Absolutely. area, which is where we ought to try to focus our, our, our attention. And the CDC does a great job. I mean, the CDC has been extraordinary in this, in, the, in, the, in this effort historically. So uh, look forward to working with you as we go forward. The caveat is always, how much money are we going to have? And thank you. Uh, that's always the way forward. But thank you for the focus and on penicillin as well. It's very interesting. You do learn something uh, every day and through this committee, you learn something. So Congressman Cole. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know my friend, the chair is trying to move us along because we're already over time. Uh, and so I'm going to keep my remarks brief and associate myself with hers. And uh, please don't take the brevity of my <laughs> remarks as uh, anything other than trying to help in terms of the time, because these are important topics and interesting. And I think uh, my friend, the chair, put her finger on it. The problem is all, always how much money do we have? And I noticed, Dr. Weiss, you were on for quite a while. So you you got an earful of the number of, of requests that my friend, the chair, is going to have to wrestle through and, and uh, then, uh, then put together the votes on both sides of the aisle to get, get all this across and done and hopefully uh, on time. Uh, so uh, we're going to work with her on that, try to be su as supportive as we can, but we really appreciate your testimony. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Um, I, I, I thank the ranking member, and um, it's just that I see all these people waiting, and I think we're about an hour behind in so far because it's so, you know, these, these issues are so, are so critical. Um, but Dr. Sandra Harris-Hooker, um, uh, Senior Vice President for Research, Administration, Professor of Pathology at Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, we welcome your testimony and you're recognized for five minutes. Chair DeLaroe, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee, good morning. And thank you for the opportunity to present testimony in support of programs impacting health, minority health and health disparities. And greetings on behalf of our president and CEO, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice. Morehouse School of Medicine is one of four historically black medical schools. These four schools have trained approximately half of the black physicians in this country. The subcommittee's investments in health professions training, medical research and public health have been very meaningful. They provide our institution with resources needed to, to drive improvements in health status for all Americans and help us to provide our students with opportunities for, for careers in health-related professions, which is clearly a national priority. I would be remiss if I did not thank the subcommittee for its responsiveness to the COVID-19 pandemic. Your commitment to providing the resources needed to establish the Higher Education Emergency Release Fund has been tremendous and allowed us to respond to the needs of our students faculty and staff, as well as play a leadership role in improving public health practices in communities nationwide. Our complete list of funding recommendations is included in our written testimony, but with the limited time for my oral remarks, I want to focus on two key programs important to the Morehouse School of Medicine and other minority health profession schools. The first is the Research Centers at Minority Institutions, acronym RSMI. 
which is administered by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, NIMHD. Historically, the RSMI program has provided the resources needed for our schools to begin to build, with emphasis on begin to build, a research infrastructure comparable to non-minority institutions, allowing us to attract world-class researchers, expand research facilities, and support cutting edge investigation into questions about why health disparities still exist and how to improve the health status of each American. As the subcommittee has increased funding for NIMHD, funding for the RSMI program has not grown at the same rate. Furthermore, RSMI program funding opportunity opportunities, excuse me, have become more focused on research project grants and less on capacity building. While both of these are certainly needed, our schools need the resources to build capacity to successfully compete for research project grants and other funding opportunities. As the subcommittee considers its funding recommendations, we urge that the RCMI program be provided with a detailed level of funding that is consistent with the growth of the NIMHD budget. Moreover, we urge the subcommittee to re-emphasize the historic infrastructure building focus of the program, including providing $15 million annually of annual funding to support clinical and translational research infrastructure in historically black medical schools comparable to that provided to majority medical schools. Funding for infrastructure for clinical research resources and facilities is critical to advancing health equity among the most vulnerable populations in this country. Secondly, in March, President Biden signed the bipartisan John Lewis NIMHD Research Endowment Revitalization Act. This new law solved a glitch in the underlying NIMHD Research Endowment Program statute that precluded several historically eligible institutions, including Morehouse School of Medicine, from even competing for this important program. This endowment helps us to build an endowment that will enable us to be on the average of other health professional schools. Now that this eligibility glitch is resolved, we ask that $50 million be put into that fund. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this testimony to the committee. And I'm pleased to answer any questions or provide additional information. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, let me yield to Congressman Cole for any comments or questions he may have. Just very quickly, uh, Madam Chair, I want to thank Dr. Harris Hooker for her testimony and uh, and for spotlighting what this committee has learned uh, during probably new before, but I think is much more acutely aware of uh, about uh, the social disparity in both outcomes and the unrepresentative nature of uh, many of our health care providers and how important it is to uh, address that imbalance uh, going forward uh, and very much appreciate the work of uh, the medical schools associated, the four you mentioned with historically black colleges and university. What an extraordinary contribution they've made uh, to, uh, to the country's health care and, and uh, what we need to do to expand capacity, quite frankly, uh, going forward. So uh, thank you for coming before us. And with that, I yield back uh, to the chair. Uh, thank you very, very much. And I associate my comments with those of the, the ranking member. Uh, I think the uh, uh, historic black college medical schools and the professional training that one of the most serious areas is that we need to have many, many more uh, minority medical professionals here uh, to deal with the what has been uh, demonstrated in terms of the disparities that exist in our healthcare system. Uh, so we, uh, and the training is critical and you're equipped to do it. You need the resources to do it, and we uh, we we un we understand that. Um, and again, 
uh, we will be looking at what those numbers are and maybe making a decision, but I thank you for the very strong testimony and the work of the historic black medical schools. So thank you very, very much, Dr. Hooker. Let me now recognize uh, Katie Ray Jones, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Katie, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Delaro, Ranking Member Cole, and distinguished subcommittee members. Thank you for the opportunity to write testimony on the importance of continued federal investment in the hotline, which is authorized as part of the Family Violence Prevention Services Act and administered by the Family Violence Prevention Family Violence and Prevention Program, a program of the Family Youth and Services Bureau under the Administration for Children and Families at the Department of Health and Human Services. The hotline established in 1996 is the only 24-7, 365 national organization that directly serves victims of domestic violence, their friends and family via phone, chat, and text. We are currently experiencing our highest contact volume in our 25-year history. And to help meet this overwhelming need, I am here to request the subcommittee increase the investment in the hotline in fiscal year 2023 to $27 million. The hotline services are free and confidential. We have the most comprehensive survivor resource database in the country. Our advocates help victims and their families and friends, whether they are in the throes of an emergency, seeking local help, or just in need of someone to talk to in that moment. Our expertise is routinely sought by national and regional media, federal, state, and local governments, service providers, law enforcement, and nonprofit colleagues. On December 30th, 2021, a hotline advocate answered our six millionth contact since our inception. Truly a bittersweet mi milestone. In calendar year 2021, the hotline received over 620,000 contacts. We also knew once life returned to any kind of normalcy from the devastating impact of COVID-19, there would be more survivors needing support who had not felt safe to reach out during the height of the pandemic. Sadly, our instincts were accurate. In February 2022, the hotline experienced the highest, highest monthly contact volume in our history, 74,000 contacts reaching out for help in 28 days. Also in February, in an effort to use their technology to help survivors connect with our services, Google launched a new crisis search engine optimization. After this launch, volume nearly doubled overnight, a powerful and somber illustration of how many are impacted by relationship abuse and need services for support. We desperately need to add a record number of new advocates on the lines and implement technology advancements to manage this kind of volume. We need to increase our impact through Love is Respect, an initiative that engages, educates, and empowers young people to prevent and end abusive relationships. We also deeply value working in partnership with several national organizations to serve victims with specialized needs. The hotline has worked with the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center to help design and implement a native-run domestic violence helpline that provides culturally specific assistance to native victims of domestic violence. And in March, 2017, Strong Hearts Native Helpline was launched. In addition, the hotline also works with abused deaf women's advocacy services to provide intervention, education, information, and referrals to callers who are deaf through the National Deaf Domestic Violence Hotline. While we are proud of how we've expanded our region services in order to meet the hotline's primary goal of serving all survivors, we are also aware there remain some specialized populations we have yet to serve, such as those who choose to cause harm. This includes about 9% of our total contacts who reach out seeking information and support for changing their harmful behaviors. With additional and specifically dedicated funding, such as the $1 million championed by Representative Lloyd Dock out of Doggett out of Tex Texas, we hope to explore opportunities to help abusive partners recognize their behavior and access support to change them. It takes a comprehensive, multi-layered national, state, regional, and local approach to fully support survivor safety and recovery. While we offer important emergency and support services for victims of domestic violence, our goal is to connect these survivors with local programs that have resources to help victims identify shelter, transitional housing, culturally specific programs, legal assistance, and economic supports necessary to help them escape their abusers. We urge the committee to also provide robust support to these life-saving programs. Throughout my testimony, I have shared with you the tremendous impact of the dedicated advocates at the hotline. 
As, I, as a result, I urge the subcommittee to continue its bipartisan support for the hotline in fiscal year 2023 through an appropriation of $27 million. These funds would allow us to increase staffing by hiring additional advocates and support staff. When someone reaches out for help, we need to be able to answer. In conclusion, I would like to share feedback from a survivor who called the hotline. This conversation has been incredible. I feel like the tears in my heart are starting to dry up. Thank you for supporting me and helping me reach my own solutions. I feel so much hope and empowerment and like the healing has begun for me. As you said, Chairwoman Delaro earlier, we need to seize the moment. And when someone calls for help, we need to be able to answer. Thank you for your time. And thank you again for your continued support for victims of domestic violence. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your advocacy. Um, I think we all know, uh, you know, when you just talked and, and you quoted hope and empowerment, um, that, that really is key and critical uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to this effort. And it's been, um, we have moved, we, we have moved so far with regard to domestic violence. Uh, again, a problem exacerbated by the pandemic, uh, hearing more uh, about that. And so that um, we, we need to, um, you know, again, as I say, seize this moment uh, to, to act on, on it and to provide you with a trained personnel, you know, help you with trained personnel because somebody at the end of that line has the ability to, uh, to empower, to save a life, uh, you, you, you know, and someone who isn't, uh, you know, trained, you know, it, 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 it could go in, it can go in a different direction. So, but what, um, uh, we're there. I mean, I, people are there again. It's a question of what, mon what the money is going to be. But it, it, overall, there really is a very basic understanding uh, of what the circumstances are and how we have to deal with that hope and empowerment. Congressman Cole. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll try and be brief, Madam Chair. Number one, I want to thank uh, our witness. Uh, very effective, very powerful advocacy. I particularly want to thank you as a Native American for the work that you've done in that area. That's a community, as you know, yes. that has been disproportionately suffering mm -hmm. uh, from this issue. And I want to thank two other people, too. I want to thank the President of the United States, who, as a senator, you know, did Violence Against Women yes, Act and has been probably the foremost champion uh, in this area over the years. And I want to thank our chair, oh. Uh, because we wouldn't have gotten the Violence Against Women Act reauthorized if it hadn't been writing on the back of her bill uh, when we finally got an omnibus bill done. And we, we had struggled, my friends on both sides of the aisle that were supportive of that legislation, to try and work through some of the knotty issues, uh, because how anybody can be against the, uh, that legislation is beyond me. Uh, but uh, it had not been for this committee and our chair uh, that would uh, would still be lingering out there, would not have gotten across the finish line uh, in, in this most recent omnibus bill. Uh, so uh, even though we're not supposed to legislate uh, on appropriation bills, some, sometimes we do. Uh, and uh, it has to be with the consent of both sides, obviously. And in this case, we got that, but we wouldn't have it without the leadership of my friend, the chair. But thank you again for highlighting this. Thank you for the incredible work um, that your volunteers and advocates and professionals do, uh, helping people uh, in an incredibly traumatic and difficult and often isolated situation. And uh, when they reach out uh, and ask for help, it, uh, as my friend the chair said, it needs to be there uh, and robustly and quickly. And, and we need to help people get out of these situations or through them in, in a way that protects them physically and emotionally and their children physically and emotionally uh, and hopefully helps anybody engaged in this activity to find a different way to, to work through whatever their issues and problems are. But again, uh, Madam Chair, you've been a leader here. I appreciate it. I look forward to continuing to work with you on it. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will work with you, Katie Rick. Um, uh, let me now introduce Rick Ginsburg, Dean of the School of Education at the University of of Kansas, uh, the Learning and Education Academic Research Network of the LEARN Coalition. Uh, Mr. Ginsburg. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair DeLauro, uh, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, we appreciate your work on all of our behalf. Um, I have been Dean of the School of Education and Human Sciences at the University of Kansas for 17 years. 
but in my role as Dean, I'm also co-chair of the Learn Coalition, a coalition of 41 leading research universities of education across the country, which supports critical investments in research aimed at advancing the scientific understanding and improving of learning and development. We advocate for greater funding for these priorities across all federal agencies. And today I'll be speaking on the need for increased funding uh, towards IES and two institutes within NIH, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and the National Institute of Mental Health. I wanna start by noting that the Learn Coalition is deeply appreciative of the increases provided to IES and NIH in uh, fiscal year 2022. And we hope to build on this momentum to continue that strengthening in fiscal year 2023. We're also grateful for the inclusion of, of the report language in fiscal year 2022 on the importance of the administration appointing members to the National Board of Education Sciences. Unfortunately, NBES has been able to meet due to a lack of a quorum since 2016. We encourage the subcommittee to continue urging the administration to fill these important roles. Turning to the main purpose of my testimony, I'm here today to request no less than $815 million for IES overall, with $225 million dedicated to the research development and dissemination line item, and $70 million for the National Center for Special Education Research, NICSER. IES is essential to developing a comprehensive, reliable, and evidence-based, uh, evidence ensuring that teaching and learning practices in our country are grounded in evidence and research. While only 12 to 15% of NCER and NICSER's applications have received rewards over the past several years, the number of grant competitions offered by IES are currently severely limited due to chronic understaffing within the, within the agency. Furthermore, NICSER was unable to fund all the grant applications rated outstanding or excellent in fiscal year 2021 due to a lack of sufficient funds. Such evidence displays how IES is currently too understaffed and too underfunded to support the nation's education research infrastructure. We believe that an appropriation of $815 million for IES overall with $225 million designated for rd and will support the continued examination of what works uh, and does not work to further education systems curriculum, instructional techniques, and assessments. This additional funding should also boast, bolster IES works towards COVID-19 recovery. IES is also integral to the education research training pipeline by providing key training and grant opportunities to increase the number of education researchers who can successfully compete for IES funded research. Making the case for more IES funding, the renowned National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine just released a report in March called The Future of Education Research at IES. The Academy urged Congress to increase appropriations for IES as it is severely underfunded despite an expanding workload. Indeed, the uh, Academy report recognized, and I'm quoting them here, that IES does not uh, appear to be on par with that of other scientific funding agencies in terms of the amount of dollars. In addition to our request uh, for IES overall, we urge Congress to provide $70 million for special education research through NICSER. NICSER currently has a budget that has remained relatively flat since 2014. A long time. This has negatively impacted the research that provides special educators and administrators the evidence-based resources needed to improve academic outcomes for students with, with or at risk of disabilities. Last, I'd like to emphasize the importance of increased NIH funding. The Learn Coalition was disappointed that the president's fiscal year, uh, fiscal 2023 budget request did not include a healthy increase for the base NIH budget, but rather focused on increased ARPA-H funding. Operage funding certainly is important, but that should supplement and not supplant NIH funding. Specifically, we believe the two programs require strong federal funding. This is why the Learn Coalition is requesting $2.02 billion for NICHD to examine brain functions and the impact of different educational services on learning and development. We also support an increase in funding for NIMH to $2.57 billion. This increase will help further understanding of the behavioral, biological, and environmental mechanisms necessary for developing interventions to reduce the burden of mental and behavioral disorders and optimize learning and development. Uh, the Learn Coalition believes that collectively these investments in education and research will drive improvements in school, teacher, and student performance in the coming years. Thank you again for considering these requests. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you may have.
Uh, let me yield to the ranking member for comments or questions that he may have. I'll uh, try to make uh, two quick points. Uh, first of all, number one, uh, well, three points. Thank you for your testimony. It's very helpful, very illuminating. Secondly, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, the chair and I agree with you about the imbalance uh, between NIH funding and ARPA-H, and we say that as joint supporters of ARPA-H, and I, I suspect you will see uh, that addressed in the bill. We don't want to lose the record that we've built up of uh, working together in a bipartisan fashion to steadily uh, increase NIH funding. We think that's paid enormous dividends um, for, the, uh, for the country. And, and finally, I couldn't help but note looking behind you, uh, uh, the uh, very proud Kansas Jayhawk as a fellow Big 12 guys. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate you on that amazing national title game uh, where you uh, uh, where Coach Self and uh, your Jayhawks uh, pulled off one of the great games I've ever seen in an NCAA final. So uh, well done, Kansas. So with that, Madam Chair, yield back. Thank you. Thanks very, very much. And uh, I, I was, and, and the ranking member addressed the issue that we will try to create the balance uh, in uh, NIH and in, uh, uh, with, with ARPA-H in terms of basic research. Um, but also, I, I think it's a fa fascinating in the, in, in the testimony. We had a hearing, uh, may have been yesterday, you lose track of time around here, uh, but um, uh, where we uh, uh, heard that with regard to special education teachers, that there really is such a shortage um, and a field that grows bigger with the number of kids that we are, are trying to, um, uh, to provide an education for. So the role of being able to increase um, that number or understanding how it needs to be taught and therefore then the training of professionals in this area, I think can uh, uh, really be helpful in overall in terms of of a quality education uh, for, you know, for our kids. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's uh, the, the, the data, you're a little bit like, I, it looks, seems to me like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS uh, for education with the information that you, uh, that you put together, but it's how you learn and how you teach. Basic fundamental questions uh, that underlie so much of what we do in the uh, the case with 12 space and in higher education. So the function of your, of, of your efforts are really critically important in underlying the kinds of directions that we, can, uh, that we can go in in terms of our programming. So I thank you very, very much for this the rich testimony about uh, a vital area with regard to education. And thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you both. Let me introduce now uh, Antonio Flores, Dr. Flores, President and CEO of the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. Uh, please, uh, uh, we recognize you for five minutes for your testimony. Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Call, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the importance of investing equitably in Hispanic serving institutions for fiscal year 2023. The Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, HACU, was founded in 1986 and is the only national association that represents HSIs. These 559 institutions enroll over 5 million students in the United States, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. I urge you respectfully to fund Title V Parts A and B of the Higher Education Act as follows. 250 million for developing Hispanic serving institutions, Title V Part A, or $67,150,000 above fiscal year 2022, and 100 million for promoting post-baccalaureate opportunities for Hispanic Americans under Title V Part B, or $80,340,000 above fiscal year 2022. HSIs educate more than 5 million students annually, including two thirds of the estimated 3.8 million Hispanic college students in American higher education. Most of them are first generation, 
college students and come from low-income families. They also, HSIs, enrolled twice as many African-Americans as all the historically Black colleges and universities combined. More than 40% of all Asian-Americans in college today and twice as many Native Americans as all the tribal colleges and universities put together, as well as a sizable number of non-Hispanic whites. Additionally, while only accounting for 16% of all the colleges and universities in the country, HSIs enrolled 31% of all the Pell recipients. Despite their great diversity and need, HSIs remain at the bottom of the federal funding priorities compared to other minority serving institutions and HBCUs. Federal investments are essential to strengthen our workforce by enhancing educational attainment, especially in STEM and other fields of national priority. The U.S. Census Bureau reported that from 2010 to 2020, Hispanics accounted for more than half the total growth of our national population and are now over 63 million strong. And it is estimated that the Hispanic population will grow by 93.5% from 2016 to 2060. Therefore, from 2020 to 2030, three of every four new workers joining the American labor force will be Hispanic. HSIs educate and train the most diverse and underserved communities and do so with fewer federal resources per student than their peer institutions. As the nation looks to rebuild the economy after the pandemic, it is critical that federal investments strengthen our workforce by enhancing the educational capacity of HSIs to pay the path of success and opportunity for Hispanics and other underserved Americans. As the Hispanic growth rate and K-12 enrollment continues to accelerate, the number of Hispanic high school graduates is expected to increase by 49% between 2012 and 2028, compared to 23% of Asian Pacific Islanders and to a net drop of 3% and 15% for Blacks and Whites, respectively. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has projected that the Latino share of the workforce will increase dramatically from one in 10 in 2010 to one in three by 2050, while white workers will decrease in number considerably, Blacks will remain at 12%, Asian Americans will increase from 5 to 8% and all others from 2 to 5%. For America to remain competitive in the global economy, a much better educated and trained Hispanic labor force is required. HSIs must be placed at the top of the federal investment priorities without further delay. Haku and its supporters wholeheartedly commend the U.S. Congress and the administration for funding generally HBCUs and other minority serving institutions. And we urge them to continue, continue doing so. Likewise, we exhort Congress and the president to invest in, with equal commitment in HSIs and their underserved students. They truly are the future of the nation. On behalf of HACU and the nation's 559 Hispanic seven institutions it represents, I thank you most sincerely for your time and consideration of our request. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your, your testimony, Dr. Flores. And I, I, I'm really, uh, uh, in, you never sit back on what you've done, but always to move forward, but I was very excited that what we did in this conference committee in this uh, in, in the 2022 bill, um, we increased the uh, uh, the HSIs about 23 percent. It was historic in terms of that. And let me, I'm just going to leave it uh, with with this uh, that it's my intention that we continue um, the, that historic climb with regard to HSIs. So thank you. Uh, you know, I thank you for what you do, and uh, uh, really, it's a it was, Pleasure to listen to you. Thank you. 
And with that, let me uh, yield to Congressman Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, Dr. Forbes, that was an excellent presentation, uh, really compelling, frankly. And the statistics that uh, you laid out are, I think, more than informative. I think they're, they're persuasive uh, as well. And uh, I agree with the chair. Uh, these are institutions that are doing an amazing job. And uh, uh, as your numbers suggest, they're only going to become more important uh, in the future as this population has become a larger percentage of our total population. So this is an area that uh, uh, I know my friend and I will work on together. I was uh, very pleased to see the increase in the appropriations in the 22 bill, and uh, I pledge to continue to work with her to see that uh, we, we try to move forward in this area. But again, thank you for an excellent, excellent presentation. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, let me recognize Janet Hamilton, the Executive Director of the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Janet Hamilton, Executive Director of the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, or CSTE. CSTE represents public health epidemiologists nationwide working to respond to emerging public health threats. For fiscal year 2023, CSTE asks that you provide at least $250 million for CDC's Data Modernization Initiative, or DMI. Since I last testified in front of this committee three years ago, we have made progress in our public health data systems, delivering data faster to save lives. But we are not done yet. As we saw during COVID-19, our public health data systems were not prepared, nor is COVID-19 the last threat we will face. As we speak, a monkeypox outbreak is spreading globally and a completely new threat is causing unexplained hepatitis in children. State and local public health departments are busy responding to these potential cases, but they cannot do this without the key data pieces to inform the investigation. Public health response happens at the local level, and we must preserve the role that state, territorial, tribal, and local health departments play in our public health data infrastructure. Led by the CDC, state and local health departments need a nationwide public health surveillance system to detect and respond to threats. To build this infrastructure, we need resources to support our existing laws. All states have laws that require the reporting of certain public health threats by physicians, hospitals, and laboratories. It is the process by which these data are reported that the DMI seeks to improve. With our partners in the Data Elemental to Health campaign, CSTE called on Congress to provide the first ever dedicated funding for public health data systems in fiscal year 2020. Thanks to this subcommittee, Congress has provided more than $1 billion through annual and supplemental appropriations for DMI. Data Elemental to Health estimates that the actual need for data modernization is at least $7.84 billion over five years. Yes, we know that is a big number, but we also know how important it is to get this right. There are five key pillars of the Data Modernization Initiative that are part of an enterprise-wide interoperable approach. More details are available in my written testimony, but to recap quickly. First, electronic case reporting or ECR assures that when providers see patients, demographic and clinical information along with test results for reportable conditions are rapidly shared with state and local public health. ECR is closing health equity blind spots. Initial implementations demonstrate over 90% completeness of race and ethnicity data, far better than the 65% we had without this critical tool. State, local, tribal, and territorial health department staff contact and interview cases and then provide the case investigation data to the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System, NNDSS, the second pillar of DMI. But resources are lacking. With COVID-19, there are numerous examples where health department staff conduct outbreak investigations or identify clusters from genomic sequencing, but are unable to electronically share those data with NNDSS due to agency infrastructure shortages. The third pillar of DMI is electronic lab reporting where labs submit test results to public health as soon as they're available. 
Test results often serve as the first piece of information received by state and local public health to launch a rapid response. The fourth pillar is electronic vital record systems, which ensures real-time transmission of birth and death data for statistical and surveillance purposes. And the fifth pillar, the National Syndromic Surveillance Program helps detect, monitor, control, and prevent emerging diseases. These five pillars are interwoven and each plays a key role in moving us from a sluggish, outdated and burdensome patchwork of systems to a 21st century public health data infrastructure that provides complete, accurate and instantaneous data. We do not have a science problem. We have a resource problem. To make our public health systems work now and in the future, we need regular, sustained, annual funding for our public health surveillance systems and data workforce. Again, we respectfully request the subcommittee provide at least $250 million for DMI in fiscal year 2023. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, we, we put in, I guess, $100 million uh, in the 2022 bill for data modernization. I think we've had enough uh, hearings. And again, that was done on a bipartisan basis. I think the recognition that uh, we nearly had the collapse of the, uh, the CDC during the pandemic because of a lack of public health infrastructure. So let me be uh, succinct with you. Uh, we're committed to doing that. To, uh, 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 and I, I, again, I was at the CDC on Friday and we had a report on the data modernization, which is extraordinary. I will just, um, uh, 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 and, the, and the progress that's already been made. We're going to work to continue to move that forward. And also, I want to try to take a look of introducing what are the kinds of authorities the CDC needs to have in order to be able to collect data on a uniform basis and have the data reported back to the CDC uh, in real time and not have a patchwork of, 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 of uh, uh, data that's out there that is uh, held back from the CDC. So. I will leave it there, but committed to um, uh, increasing that opportunity. We have to come out of this pandemic with the public health infrastructure so that in fact, this doesn't happen again with regard to the CDC. The CDC is too vital to our uh, 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 you know, healthcare system. Congressman Cole. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Dr. Hamilton, I remember you, the last time you testified because it was one of the very last hearings that we had yes, before COVID hit us. And in that sense, uh, prophetic in the, in the warnings that uh, uh, you and others were issuing about the need to do exactly what you're here advocating for today. And uh, I, I will reiterate uh, the chairman's support. Uh, we, we think what you're doing is important. We think these investments are critical. Uh, we think they need to be sustained uh, going forward, but it's always timely for you to come back and remind us. Uh, and uh, I'll be working with the chair so we can continue the progress we've made. I think it's absolutely essential to the public health and well-being of the American people going on and we get out of this patchwork into a much more um, uniform, modern, uh, and uh, effective system that gives us the information we need to, to respond in a timely fashion uh, in the, to threats that, that genuinely, as we saw, can, can quickly get out of hand and, and be just devastating uh, to our population and, and honestly, people around the world. So uh, again, I don't think this is an area of any, any debate between the chair and me. I think this is uh, where we'll have to scratch our heads and see if, how we find the resources for all these worthy causes. But th th there's just no question this investment needs to be made. But thanks for coming before the committee. Thanks for the work you and your colleagues and public health have done and for the extraordinary performance uh, over the pandemic uh, uh, where, uh, you know, I've just seen local public health people do amazing things. And uh, the data has made a difference as we've Congress has tried to come together and figure out what to do during the pandemic to both minimize the loss of life and get us through this uh, and to the other side of it with our economy intact and uh, our people damaged as little as possible. So thanks for your contributions. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Recognize it's Moira 
Let me see if I have this right. Shalaji? Very okay. good. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, President of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. To Chairwoman Deloro and Ranking Member Cole, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in today's public witness testimony. My name is Moira Salaji. I'm a primary care pediatrician and president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. On behalf of the AEP, I thank you for all of your efforts to fund programs that are essential for the optimal health and well being of children. While I address numerous programs that are important for children's health in my written testimony, my original plan today was to focus on three programs of particular importance, firearm injury and mortality prevention research, the pediatric subspecialty loan repayment program, and the pediatric mental health care access program. I plan to talk about the need to address the serious gaps in the pediatric workforce by increasing funding for the Pediatrics of Specialty Loan Replacement Program to $30 million to improve access to care for children with special health care needs. This program is vital and very much needed. And I had planned to discuss increasing funding for the Pediatric Mental Health Care Access Grant Program to $14 million to help meet the mental health challenges facing young people and the rates of suicide, anxiety, and depression that have all been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, especially among people of color. We do need to increase mental health services for children and enhance the capacity of pri pediatric primary care providers to screen, treat, and refer children with mental health concerns. But then we got the news about the school shooting at Robb Elementary School in Evalde, Texas on Tuesday. And that is what is at the top of my mind today. 19 students and two teachers killed by gunfire. Just like the 10 people shot at the top supermarket in Buffalo and the one person killed and five injured at the Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church in my home state of California just weeks ago. There's never any justification for this kind of violence anywhere, ever. And yet we as a nation have been here before too many times. Columbine High School, Sandy Hook Elementary, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, and so many other schools have been sites of terror, violence, and death. Many more daily acts of gun violence do not even make the headlines, but also rob children of their childhood and families of their children. Just visit a hospital emergency department to see the daily toll of firearm injuries. In fact, a CDC report published just this month showed that the US experienced a historic rise in gun deaths in 2020 and communities of color were disproportionately harmed. As a pediatrician, parent and grandmother and someone whose personal life has been affected by gun violence, I urge you to stand up for those killed or injured by gun violence. The AAP was extremely grateful when this subcommittee agreed to provide federal funding for gun violence prevention research in the 2020 fiscal year for the first time in 25 years. And we are tremendously appreciative of Congress providing $25 million to the CDC and NIH for firearm injury and mortality prevention research for the last three fiscal years. But if events from the past several weeks show anything, it is that we need to do more. And one thing we need to do is increase research on ways to reduce gun violence and disparities in gun-related deaths and to prevent the next shooting at a school, a church, or in another public setting. Federally funded public health research has a proven track record of reducing deaths, whether from motor vehicle accidents or smoking. The same approach should be applied to increasing gun safety and reducing firearm-related injuries and deaths, including suicides. Continuing and expanding CDC and NIH research is critical to that effort. We strongly urge Congress to increase the funding level for firearm injury and mortality prevention research to 35 million for the CDC and 25 million for NIH. We should never become accustomed to acts of gun violence. We owe it to the children in that classroom in Novalde, the people shopping at Tops and the parishioners at the Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church to increase our efforts. 
Thank you so much for allowing me to testify today. I look forward to continuing this conversation. I'm gonna to yield to Congressman Cole uh, for any comments or questions. Oh, I wanna thank the, uh, the witness for her testimony. It's very powerful and certainly uh, very compelling I know, I don't think given I the tragic events that we've on. had this week. Uh, and I want to uh, uh, compliment the chair. She's the one that started uh, this uh, pattern of investment in gun silence research. And uh, I think uh, uh, has been probably the leader in Congress on that, uh, quite frankly. So I, uh, again, I don't know where we will end up, but uh, uh, despite what uh, some people think, this has not been a matter where we've had any big differences, quite frankly. Uh, we signaled that, I think, and maybe in 2019, Madam Chair, we put language in there that uh, to try and, and uh, let the uh, uh, CDC and the NIH know that you please go ahead and, and if you decide that. And then my friend, the chair, followed up with an appropriation, I think, the very next year when the hint wasn't taken. So let's just put the money specifically there and, and, and give you an unmistakable signal. So uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think studying problems hurts. I think it helps. And, uh, and uh, again, I tip my hat to the chair for having been a leader in this area and yield back. I thank the ranking member and uh, I thank for the, the really the, the cooperative effort. We had the hearings on this and this is an issue of public health. Um, and that's what we want to try to, uh, you know, to, to, to deal with it. And it, it is in no, no way to restrict anybody's rights uh, to uh, own a firearm, um, but to understand as way you pointed out um, that, you know, we've done this with uh, automobile safety, we've done this with smoking, you know, and, and we've come out with some very, very good uh, remedies uh, here that have cut down on automotive accidents and deaths and, and the same with uh, with, with, with smoking. There isn't any reason why not to do this. We are going to continue. We are going to continue to do this. And every time an event happens, uh, like it happened two days ago, uh, there's more and more need for us to, to, to understand. Uh, for me on the education side, I, I would put a mental health professional in every school in the United States. Uh, that's, you know, that, that would be, you know, the way to, help deal with, with our kids. But the aftermath of what happens, and I, I, I really have got my mind's eye, this little boy that I heard this morning who survived, the fourth grader. And he was shaking while he was talking about what he saw around him, you know, with his, uh, his pals, his friends who were, who were killed. And, you know, what happens in that beautiful little brain? What, what, what goes on? How can we prevent? How can we do this? So thank you. Thank for your, for your focus on this and there's so many other areas that you do focus on. You really provide direction uh, for us and we rely on your, your, uh, your data, your work, your, you know, and your commitment. So thanks very much. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Let me uh, to... Uh, uh, introduce Mark Anthony Figueroa, uh, a Gear Up alumnus and the for the National Council of Community and Education uh, Partnerships. And uh, I know how the ranking member feels about the Gear Up program. So, Mr. Figueroa, please your testimony, and uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair Deloro, Ranking Member Cole, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to provide testimony on the profound impact that the Gaining Early Awareness and Readiness for Undergraduate Programs Initiative, better known as Gear Up, has had on my life. My name is Mark Anthony Figueroa, and it is my honor and pleasure to be sharing this testimonial on behalf of Gear Up alumni and over half a million Gear Up students across the country. Given the program's return on investment, I respectfully urge the committee to appropriate $435 million for Gear Up in fiscal year 2023 to support an additional 80,000 students across our country so that they too can have the support I received in Gear Up. As you may know, Gear Up provides six to seven year grants to states and partnerships comprised of K-12, higher education, and community-based organizations that strengthen pathways to college and careers in low-income communities. 
GearUp exposes students and their families starting in the seventh grade to comprehensive intervention that follow them through high school graduation and optionally through the first year of post-secondary education. GearUp uses early and sustained interventions to ensure that students are successful in rigorous courses, are knowledgeable about the steps necessary to prepare for life beyond high school, and ultimately enroll in a high quality certificate, associates, or bachelor's degree program that suits their goals. In the most recent year, in which we had a large class of graduating seniors, the post-secondary enrollment rates of GearUp students were over 31% higher than low-income students nationally. Considering that GearUp achieved this critical goal at a cost of approximately $645 per student per year, I strongly believe that the investment in GearUp pays significant dividends. GearUp is a powerful catalyst for sustained community improvement. I grew up on the eastern part of Washington State in the city of Pasco. This part of the country is filled by passionate Latino and Latina immigrant and migrant families working in predominantly agricultural fields. With long days and hard work, preparing for a higher education can be challenging and a first for many. As a first-generation migrant student and the eldest of six in my family, post-secondary education seemed like a very distant, daunting, unknown land with no clear path towards it. However, participating in the GIRO program helped me actualize my dreams of a post-secondary education through mentors, college and career fairs, FAFSA nights, and college admissions workshops. Being the first in my family to pursue a higher education, my parents and I had so many questions. It is a daunting process, especially if done alone. Nevertheless, Girub was there to support and walk us the entire way. Because of Girub, I was admitted and graduated from Washington State University. With these experiences and the confidence that Girub gave me, I was able to develop strong leadership skills, community connections, and discovered all the ways to give back to my community. During my time at Washington State University, I connected with other first generation migrant students, and we encouraged one another to follow our dreams. I was elected and served in student government and also helped lead a student ministry at the intersection of faith and culture. Having led the way with the support of Europe, I am now there for my parents and five sisters as they navigate the college going process. Currently, I work with local civic engagement organizations to encourage marginalized members of my community to elevate their voices and get involved. As a current diversity advocate, a former high school history teacher, a soccer coach at the high school where GEARUP supported me, and a graduate student pursuing a master's degree in theology, I can attest to the truth that GEARUP does work. For me, none of this would have been possible without the guidance of the GEARUP program. Through my own achievements in attending post-secondary education, I can see that generational barriers in my family have been removed for future generations and they may find the same success that I have through education. While the support that Gira provided me was truly priceless, the only way that other students will be able to access the educational experiences I had because of Gira will be to continue to increase funding. Acknowledging that I am just one of thousands of families Gira has positively impacted highlights the impact of the Gira program. As you take on the work of preparing for the fiscal year 2023 appropriations, I respectfully urge you to consider increasing the investment in the GIRO program to $435 million so that 80,000 more students just like me can benefit from the program as I did. Thank you to the committee for taking time to hear my testimony. Thank you uh, for your testimony. And uh, uh, you are the face of the GIRO program. What a success story uh, uh, it is. And I'm going to yield to a Congressman Cole, and then I'll say something. But Congressman okay. Cole, well, I know for, you first of all, to our witness, Mr. Figueroa couldn't have done a better job. Better job. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to our friends at Gear Up, couldn't have had a better representative uh, to come before this committee. Uh, this is a program, as the chair knows, that she and I have worked on together for seven years. Wow. And I don't know where the final number would be, but for seven years in a row, we've been able to to increase this program and. Uh, you're a, a shining example of why these investments pay off. Uh, I always tell people, if we can get you to and through college, uh, you know, you're on average going to make a million dollars more in your lifetime. Don't worry, the federal government's going to get its share of that million. Uh, and so this is literally a program that pays for itself, in my view. Uh, I often point out, uh, when, in connection with TRIO, 
uh, companion program in many ways, but uh, that's produced over 5 million college graduates for this country that probably uh, would not have had the opportunity to go or succeed at college. I feel the same way about Europe. My own state is full of first-generation college students. I'm a first-generation uh, college student. And the point you make about uh, families uh, wanting to do this, you know, having their hopes, but not knowing how to navigate the way, not necessarily knowing how do we prepare, what are the things that we need to make sure uh, that uh, our son or daughter do at, at the appropriate age so they're ready to go. We don't want to just get them to college. We want them to have the background to succeed, as you clearly uh, are doing in uh, in higher education. So uh, uh, thank you for your eloquent uh, advocacy for this program and for the personal example. And thank you for pointing out what a difference the program will make, not only for you, but uh, for your brothers and sisters. And that, that's one of the big spillover impacts of this. I, I just think these programs are so uh, wise and um, again, such good investments for our country uh, to make, uh, not just individually in your future, but collectively in our own future. These things pay off big, big, big time for us. And again, I salute the chair. Uh, uh, she's always been a terrific partner uh, in this uh, 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 progress in, in this area, you know, whether she was chair or ranking member, I know how deeply she believes in the program and uh, we're going to continue to work together and hopefully we can continue to come up with good results. Uh, but thank you, Madam Chair. With that, I yield back to you. Thank you. And last year in the 22, it was $378 million. I understand it. And obviously we'll take a look at the, at, at the money, but, you know, uh, uh, oftentimes people say, you know, what, is this federal program working? Is a federal program working? Gear up works. Uh, and, and, and you are the poster child here for, you know, the success. And, and as the ranking member pointed out what the spillover effect is. So we will be, uh, gear up will be front and center for us as we move forward with the bill. So thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. And for your success. Thank you for what you're doing. An MA in theology. Okay, this is, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we now have Esther Lucero, President and CEO of the Seattle Indian Health Board. Esther, you're recognized for five minutes. Yat e bene. It's still um, morning time in the Seattle area, so just say yat e bene. Um, my name is Esther Lucero and Chair Delaro. It is a privilege to meet you, at least in this virtual setting. And um, Ranking Member Cole, it's always a, a pleasure to work with you. And I'm always honored to see another Native person in such um, a prominent role, but also with such longevity. So we're seeing each other in a different committee this time. And I, I'm pretty excited about that. So. Um, let me give you a little bit of perspective on the Seattle Indian Health Board. So we are a really unique organization in the sense that we're deemed an urban Indian health organization. And we were the very first urban Indian health organization to um, become a federally qualified health center. So what that means is we see all people, but we see all people in the native way. Now, another thing that makes us unique is we operate the Urban Indian Health Institute, which is one of 12 tribal epidemiology centers in the nation. And we are deemed a public health authority through the Indian Health Care Improvement and Act and permanently reauthorized in the Affordable Care Act. Now, these things are significant because what it allowed us to do was have um, an incredible response to COVID. And when I say incredible, it was truly community driven and it was true, truly um, culturally attuned. And I want to make sure that this committee in particular recognizes the value of community health centers and it doesn't always uh, place so much dependence upon like county systems or state systems in regards to um, becoming or being a public health authority. Um, the reason I say that is because we have an incredible relationship with our 29 federally recognized tribes here in the state of Washington. And they advocated so that we could actually have a more community centered response to COVID. And for that reason, we have 98% of all of our American Indians, Alaska Natives in Seattle in the King County region um, who are vaccinated. And I, I think that that's a true testament to what we're capable of doing, especially with the public health arm, where we were able to provide culturally tuned um, education and awareness and really um, develop trust with our communities. So the reason I bring up COVID is because we were 
we were able to show one another what we're capable of, right? There are so many things that we said we couldn't do, like telehealth, for example, but we did it, right? We were able to pivot in a, on a dime to make sure that we could meet the needs of our people. Now, something else that occurred through COVID is that we've seen the, the most significant increase in investment in Indian Health Service in my entire history, probably in my lifetime. And when we think about this particular committee, um, Medicaid has been used to, to grossly supplement an underfunded system, right? And so when I think about that, we were actually successful at securing 100% FMAP in a two-year pilot. And how that resulted was um, it resulted in $18 million cost savings for the state of Washington, which was then allocated to an urban Indian line item. And now we are using it as a pilot to demonstrate the impact of traditional Indian medicine as a billable service. Now, obviously, if we could extend 100% FMAP in perpetuity, then that would actually increase our ability to provide culturally attuned services, which inevitably um, results in cost savings in the emergency centers, right? Because culture actually is preve prevention and one of the best ways to overcome trauma. Additionally, we operate the 65-bed uh, residential treatment program, Thunderbird Treatment Center, which we had to push pause on services because there was a lack of infrastructure dollars. Now, we are about to reinstate that, that facility and expand it to 92 beds for a couple of reasons. One is the opioid crisis re reminded us that we have to actually adapt our environment to not only do the traditional abstinence-based recovery programs, but also to do medically assisted treatment in an inpatient facility. We also have a desperate need to expand our services to support the needs of pregnant and parenting women. And so we've identified a site and we'll be purchasing that site and rebuilding um, to address those needs. Now, the reason that's significant is because another thing we saw is finally we had in investments in infrastructure related to behavioral health, right, behavioral health expansion through HRSA, and also um, to expand, we were able to use our grant dollars to expand in other ways. And I'd like to see that continued because what the problem is, is that we don't have enough beds. The problem is we don't have enough housing. The problem is we just don't have enough resources to solve some of these things that are exacerbated by things like pandemic. And so when I think about, um, you know, things that are really challenges, I think about workforce development. And here we are in the age of the great resignation or great resignation. And we need a significant investment, particularly in mental health services. If we're going to put a mental health provider into every single school system, like you said, Chair Delario, then we must invest in our workforce. And so we're asking for a $1 billion investment in the Indian Healthcare Workforce Development Program so that organizations like ours can continue to really um, add and build to that infrastructure. So I just want to say thank you for your support, and it's an honor to be here with you today. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for the richness of the, the presentation uh, there and your, your, your strong leadership uh, in, the, in this effort. Uh, really, it is... Uh, um, it's more than encouraging. It really is, you know, because look, and 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 the the ranking member can speak, you know, on a granular basis about the Indian Health Service. It's been a priority of his, mm -hmm. you, you know. Uh, it really, I think it's historic. You know, his, you know, it's all about who who he is. Um, but uh, uh, I, I'm happy to hear you say that the increase that we did do for the IHS was historic. It doesn't end there. Uh, but what we need to do is to try to um, make sure that we don't have uh, a, a separate healthcare system that is not functioning uh, for uh, the, uh, uh, you know, for the Native American population. For it, it just shouldn't be. There should be parity in in the kind of health uh, uh, opportunities uh, that uh, people should have. Uh, and not and 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 that comes through if 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 it's on its if it's on its own then for gosh sakes let's make sure it has the the uh, the resources it has the trained personnel uh, and everything that is needed to deal with a myriad of problems that occur you know we uh, we talked about you know violence against women before we know that that's there we're talking about you know a uh, 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 pediatric care and children and so but I want to ask you, and I will. I, well, I want the, the um, ranking member to speak of what's your situation with infant formula, you know, uh, and how you you all are handling, you know, that uh, uh, that 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 effort. So um, uh, and telehealth, 
how can we help you, you know, with, uh, with, with that. And I thank you for the work that you did through COVID, uh, but we need many more conversations about the Indian Health Service and uh, where it, uh, uh, how we should be strengthening it and what is its uh, um, uh, direction for the future and where it should be. But so glad that you are there and thank you for such a, a powerful, uh, a powerful testimony. Congressman Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And it was a terrific presentation and right. thank you so much uh, uh, for making so many important points in, in such a brief uh, presentation. And I want to thank my friend, the chair, who's been extraordinarily helpful uh, on these issues. Um, there's a lot of things, of course, we know that uh, the witness and I would agree need to be done. Someday we'll get forward funding, just like the Veterans Administration for both our urban Indian health centers and, and uh, for IHS. Uh, and I was very pleased uh, to see uh, Secretary Becerra bring up the idea of mandatory funding. Uh, I know that's controversial on both sides of the aisle uh, with our budget hawk friends, but the reality is it's the treaty and trust obligation that the United States willingly assumed but has never fully funded. Uh, and uh, we've made some progress. Uh, I particularly uh, want to echo what you had to say about the outstanding job that our uh, urban Indian health centers did, and frankly, our tribal governments did uh, with the resources we put at their disposal during COVID. Uh, in my home state of Oklahoma, the number one vaccination site was the healthcare center at the University of Oklahoma in the middle of Oklahoma City. The number two was run by the Chickasaw Nation in Ada, Oklahoma, a town of 25,000. Uh, that, uh, and I did, I don't know, the last count I got, it was somewhere over, well over 75,000 vaccinations. And that's a while ago. Uh, and they set it up, ran it, made it available to everybody, uh, as most of our tribes did. You didn't have to be tribal. It was just another network. And frankly, in Oklahoma, as rural as we are, having the, uh, the uh, distribution of uh, vaccination sites, and in many cases, given particularly the early uh, uh, vac vaccines that had to be stored at unusually uh, you know, cold temperatures. Honestly, if you didn't have Indian hospitals in these areas, there weren't anybody else capable of actually housing the facilities. One of the reasons why, again, while they had a separate allocation, they opened up their allocations to anybody who would show up uh, yeah. for a vaccination. So they became for us an alternative uh, healthcare system uh, that served every single Oklahoman, not just tribal members, and uh, gave us a lot more reach than we otherwise would have had. And again, this committee, you know, wrote the check uh, and uh, uh, did great work under my friend's leadership, the chair. So uh, we're going to continue working on these problems. Uh, our colleague, uh, Representative McCullum, is always a, a fighter on the on the forward. Uh, appropriation front. She's uh, got the legislation. It's, I, I remember we both used to, we both still offer, but uh, we'd uh, always co-sponsor one another's bill. So we never knew who was going to be in the majority, but we knew if we had one on both sides, we'd have a chance of moving it forward. And uh, she's been a great, uh, great worker in these areas, you know, from her time as chair of the interior subcommittee. She now chairs a much bigger committee, obviously with the defense subcommittee, but she hasn't lost her passion and her focus on uh, native issues. So uh, we have a lot of friends on, on these issues in this committee. Uh, and again, it's an area where I'm really proud to say uh, the effort to move forward has been bipartisan uh, because again, trust and treaty obligations, no, no, boundary on the basis of partisanship. These are agreements we've come forward. And I want to thank you for your excellent help. We, you know, the job you've done in Seattle and uh, frankly, through the Northwest, some of our best, uh, you know, uh, urban health care centers are in the Northwest. And uh, again, the, the tribes there leaning forward, they're very, very uh, advanced and sophisticated in the care that uh, they offer. And frankly, quite quite often the additional resources beyond the federal resources that tribes, if they're doing well economically, uh, invest uh, in these facilities. I mean, that's above and beyond. Uh, I know certainly in the case of my own tribe, many of the tribes in Oklahoma, Cherokees and Choctaws and run amazing systems uh, they, where they take the federal dollars, Madam Chair, 
uh, use that. They contract directly with the federal government, but then they put their own money on top of it to provide additional resources. Uh, and again, they don't just do that for their tribes. If you're, if you're contracting, uh, you know, you, any Native American can show up at any Native American facility and be eligible for the for the care. You're not allowed to say, oh, we just take care of Chickasaws here. So when they're putting in extra money, they're putting it in quite often to help members from tribes that might not be quite as uh, blessed economically uh, as they are. And so, uh, again, I just appreciate your great work, your great testimony. Madam Chair, thanks for indulging me on the time. I know it's been a long day, but you oh, knew no, I was no, on court uh, on this particular uh, panel. Yeah. And, and thanks for all your help in this area. You've been spectacular. Thank you. Feel back. Thank you. I, you know, I, I just do want to have a question. Infant formula, how have you fared, Esther? It's been very challenging, but you know, we do what we do, which is we reach out to community and we try to identify where our rations are and we try to do that through the groups that we actually serve. Um, so that's how we've, we've been able to respond is trying to pool our resources to be able to meet the needs of our most vulnerable people. So um, I wish I had a better answer, but you yeah, know, but again, we're gonna keep at it. The issue at the moment is to yeah. deal with supply, but the safety issue is very, very critical and that we have to really be clear that what product is on the shelf is safe for these babies to take. And I see my friends at the American Academy of Pediatrics, we've seen, and I think that this is woefully underreported, the number of youngsters, babies, who are going to emergency rooms with either vomiting or diarrhea. And, uh, you know, it is directly related to a recalled product which was contaminated. So, right. uh, so again, thank you, thank you, but keep in touch with us on that as we go forward. And that would be a very, very important information okay. to see if, if the distribution is getting uh, to, to you and to, you know, to the tribes. So please, please do. Absolutely. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, and uh, let me introduce uh, Rodriguez Murray, um, Senior Vice President, Public Policy and Government Affairs at the United Negro College Fund. Rodrigo, please, uh, your testimony, and I'm recognizing you for five minutes. Thanks. Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, my name is Mr. Rodriguez Murray, Senior Vice President for Public Policy and Government Affairs for UNCF, United Negro College Fund. You may be familiar with our motto, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. UNCF has two functions. First, we raise funds on behalf of private historically black colleges and universities or HBCUs. Second, we also are a significant scholarship granting organization. Annually, UNCF awards over $100 million in scholarships to approximately 10,000 students at some 1,100 different colleges and universities. UNCF is the second largest private provider of scholarships in the country overall, Additionally, we are the largest private provider of scholarships to minorities. That means UNCF doesn't just represent the 37 member institutions or the 100 plus HBCUs, but we really represent the concerns of low to moderate income students wherever they're enrolled. Personally, I'm an HBCU and a UNCF product. When I arrived at Morehouse College, I was a first generation college student and a first generation high school graduate. Largely because of UNCF's support, I was able to graduate Morehouse nearly debt-free. This is why the testimony today is a full circle moment. HBCUs have received a great deal of attention recently. The coronavirus pandemic has brought much needed attention to long persistent disparities. HBCUs have been at the forefront of improving education and health disparities long before the issues have recently become vogue. For over 150 years, HBCUs have been educating the progeny of slaves and now do more to educate and graduate underserved students than any other group of higher education institutions in the country. Now, there has been an influx in funding to HBCUs. This subcommittee and Madam Chair, your full committee have been responsible for funding that have stabilized HBCUs and allowed us to successfully navigate the coronavirus pandemic. As much funding as has come our way, I want to be clear, a two-year influx cannot reverse 150 years of systemic, persistent underfunding. 
Now, while we're thankful for President Biden's requested proposed investments in HBCUs, I do want to draw your attention to a few budget lines. The Department of Education is strengthening HBCU discretionary program should be funded at no less than $500 million. The Strengthening Historically Black Graduate Institution discretionary program, no less than $100 million. We should forgive the remaining balances of institutions currently participating in the HBCU capital finance program. We should double the Pell Grant, and we should strengthen the pipeline training programs at the Department of Health and Human Services. Now, the top funding request for HBCUs is $500 million for strengthening HBCU, that program at the Department of Education. That program holds particular importance in our community because an institution can use the fund up to 17 different legislative ways, depending on the institution's needs. Currently funded at $337 million, all 100 accredited HBCUs compete for this pool of very limited resources. This month, our institutions graduated nearly 50,000 students. Based on that fact, that our institutions provide so much of the diverse workforce that our country values, it is our collective view that Congress should increase the program to reflect the value of our graduates. We recommend $500 million for the discretionary program. This is, again, HBCU's top funding priority. While the president's budget will seek the funded at the authorized level, I must call the subcommittee's attention to one fact. There is one single HBCU that received a funding increase last fiscal year of $100 million all by themselves. All 100 plus HBCUs were forced to share in a collective much smaller $25 million increase. This disparity in cap on overall strengthening HBCU program, um, it has to be done away with we must invest $500 million in this program and an additional $100 million in the Strengthening Historically Black Graduate Institutions program. I want to reemphasize that HBCUs meet a national need, bright, capable graduates who tend to come from underserved backgrounds. However, the education they receive enables them to become productive citizens who contribute to our country in numerous ways. And I don't even have to mention the fact that well over 40% of the CBC members, your colleagues are HBCU graduates. UNC have produced a report on the economic impact of HBCUs in November, 2017. UNC have found that one single graduating class of HBCU students will earn a minimum of $130 billion collectively, one class over their lifetime. HBCUs collectively hire and fire like a Fortune 50 company. Moreover, our institutions all together have an annual economic impact of $15 billion. HBCUs do what no other type of institutions in this country does or attempts. And for that, we hope this panel will support us by implementing the funding requests I've made today. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer each of your, any of your questions. And I want to commend you on such a long hearing day and for your attentiveness. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Rodriguez. And it's great to see you again. Uh, I was pleased to uh, be with you. I guess we, did we do that by Zoom? I lose track these days. But we when with, with, uh, with Congresswoman Alma Adams, where we all gathered uh, and so forth, so thank you for your strong presentation. And I think we're very, very uh, attuned to the role that HBCUs play uh, in our nation and in our education system. And very, very, uh, you, you know, proud that so many of our, our, our members uh, are graduates of HBCUs. So um, uh, what we did do in the last go round is you talked about the $363 uh, uh, million, it was about a seven and a half percent increase. Um, uh, and understanding we wanted to strengthen the HBCUs and, and the number of 500. I, I'm gonna be upfront with you. We need to know what our numbers are. You know, it's, 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 it's clearly, we went up last year in, in, in doing this and we made an increase. We are committed to maintaining the strength of the HBCUs. We just need to know where our numbers are gonna come out and uh, what the, then how we are gonna be able to allocate the, the funding. But there is, um, you, know, a, you know, the commitment uh, to continue to support uh, HBCUs and, uh, uh, you know, in the most robust way that we possibly can. So 
and, and again, thank you for the clarity of your, your testimony and the strength of the testimony. You are, you know, and, and, and the strength in the last meeting we had as, as well. It was a great gathering. So thank you. And let me yield to the ranking member. Well, thank you very much. And thank our witness that uh, that was an excellent and very powerful mm. uh, presentation and, and frankly, quite compelling. And obviously mm. we've had uh, several uh, representatives of different minority uh, serving institutions that have testified uh, before us today. And uh, there's a common theme that runs through them all, which is the disproportionate contribution that these institutions make uh, and how uh, high a percentage of whether it's medical professionals, and I'm sure if we were talking lawyers and obviously politicians, people might think we have too many of those. I don't know. Uh, but that way it's capped by law. So, I, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but uh, the reality is these institutions are tremendous value and uh, you know, have historically uh, overperformed on limited resources. So, uh, again, um, and I know that uh, I associate myself with the chair's remarks. Uh, it gets down to the numbers and what can we do? And we don't know that yet. But again, this is not an area where we tend to disagree or debate. It's an area where we put our heads together and see what can we find in in common, and uh, obviously there's a lot of our colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle that are enormous supporters uh, of uh, HBCUs and, uh, and weigh in as well, not just on the committee, but from other committees as well. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the great work uh, of the institutions that you represent, and we look forward to working with you going forward. Yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, and now let me introduce uh, Nancy Gonzalez, uh, owner of Little Bear's Family Daycare uh, and a member of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees and talk about child care and development of block grant. Um, and Nancy, don't take it in any um, uh, negative way. You are the last witness today and we're sorry you've had to wait so long, but we're delighted to hear, uh, del delighted to hear from you and thank you. Uh, uh, because of the importance of the child care and development block grant. Okay. You are recognized for five minutes. Uh, good morning to my Congressman, Representative Josh Harder, Chairman DeLaro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about child care investments and the need to double funding for the Department of Health and Human Services Child Care and Developmental Block Grant, CCDBG and provide 12.3 billion for FY 2023. I'm Nancy Gonzalez. I'm a state licensed family childcare provider in Modesto, California, and the owner of Little Bear's Family Daycare. I'm a proud union member of the 20,000 member strong United Domestic Workers, Child Care Providers of the United, United American Federation, State, County, and Municipal Employees. I've been providing childcare services out of my home for the past 16 years and have worked as a childcare provider for the past 29 years. I care for babies and children as young as four months and up to 12 years old, weekdays from 4.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. I open early to help families that have long commutes to work. Modesto is a rural area and is sometimes long commutes are required to get to work. <clears throat> it pains me to say this, but our country takes childcare for granted. It really does. Our childcare system is broken for families who need childcare for the underpaid, mostly black and brown women like me, who are the majority of childcare providers. Emergency funding has been helpful, raising rates in some states and helping to keep childcare programs open, but it's only a band-aid for the immediate health crisis. We need a sustainable cure that comprehensively fixes childcare to make it accessible and affordable for families and to pay providers living wages. That will require much larger investments. Doubling CCDBG will make a down payment on real childcare system. Investments in CCDGB will help families and address fairness and equity for providers. One of the biggest problems for providers and why programs are closing is low pay. Childcare providers are paid poverty level wages. Family childcare providers generally charge less and earn less. Half of the family child care providers report that they earn 23,000 or less in a year. Private pay is inadequate to ensure living wages. Adequate government funding is essential to ensure providers can learn, can earn living wages and to make child care affordable for families. 
Child care providers like me are faced with the dilemma of raising rates, knowing families will leave our care and be forced to place their young children in less safe arrangements. So I keep my rates low, but it's not just enough to cover everything my own family needs. And because CCDBG funding is not enough, the rate the state pays us does not cover the full cost, cost of care so we can earn a living wage. Many childcare providers are forced to rely on public assistance. We work multiple jobs, we can't afford health insurance or save for retirement, and we are struggling to deal with increasing costs. In some places, expenses are up 40% while reimbursement rates have, been, have not increased to keep up. Supporting worthy wages for home-based childcare providers is also an issue of equity for low-income parents especially those who work for jobs outside of the traditional nine to five hours. Most center-based childcare doesn't offer care during these hours and these parents depend on in-home based childcare. And family, family childcare is often the choice in communities of color. After everything we endured during the pandemic as frontline workers, childcare providers can't take much more. Thousands of providers closed their doors during the pandemic. Many never returned. Employers all over California and the country are hiring for jobs that pay better and have better benefits be, and then being a childcare provider. That means less childcare. Access to care is a big problem right now. More than half of people in the US are in childcare desert where childcare is either unavailable or very limited. In California, the problem is even worse, especially for low income and Latino families. I want to thank Congressman Harder for introducing legislation to address shortage of childcare providers in these key areas. After all the problems I described, why do I still do why do I still work in childcare? Simple. I love this work and the children I care for. So do my fellow childcare providers, but we do have futures and families to take care of too. I urge you to double CCDBG's budget to begin to create a childcare system that pays childcare providers living wages, entices providers to join the field and stay in it, fixes childcare deserts, expands the program to cover more families and makes high quality childcare affordable and accessible to all families. I appreciate Chairman Deloro's leadership and other committees, others on this committee to work on these and other ways to fund and fix childcare. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I just will just, uh, you, you know, quote, what you said in your, uh, in your, in your testimony, uh, it pains me as well, because our country has taken child care for granted. And uh, it was demonstrated during the pandemic that um, uh, this is a, 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 an industry, if you will, that uh, nearly collapsed, you know, and, uh, and uh, as we have dealt with an automobile industry or uh, hospitals or and anything else when when that kind of thing happens uh, it is the role in my view of the federal government to to uh, uh, step in and to do something um, uh, about it and the, the 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 piece of this is that um, given what happened uh, it, uh, the women were pushed out of the workforce because you know they their their jobs went went away uh, there was no f a, a paid family and medical leave for people staying home. Um, uh, their kids were at, 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 at home. We had the child care centers that went, went, went out of business. They just shuttered. And um, uh, so the, the entire child care crisis, you know, it was a perfect storm for understanding what was going on because the issue of low wages was, has been there for child care workers for so long, and it's one that we need to that we need to address. Um, but the other piece of this is, if this economy is going to recover uh, and women are going to go back to work, we have got to have affordable, accessible childcare uh, for families. Um, uh, otherwise, they're going to stay home because you're not just going to you, you you know abandon your children. That is so. It is. It needs to be viewed as not taking it for granted, but it being viewed as a, a cornerstone of, of a thriving economy and how this economy succeeds. Um, and uh, I, 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 so uh, 
my, my hope would have been, and uh, we, we, I don't know if what the vestiges of a bill back better would be if, if we ever get a bill back better uh, piece of legislation. Um, maybe we get something, but my hope is, is that uh, as was the case earlier, that childcare uh, would be the central portion of that. But that's on the, that side of it. But in terms of the community, uh, uh, the child care and development block grant, um, I think we did $254 million uh, increase last year. Uh, I know what you're asking for is to double the amount of money, uh, but uh, overall, uh, that's, I, I'm not going to lie to you, that's hard given that we don't know yet what our numbers are going to be, but I want you to be assured uh, that uh, uh, we're at, the, the child care is now front and center, and as we've been saying in a number of these presentations today, we need to seize this opportunity. We saw what happened in this emergency, uh, and we cannot let that happen. We cannot let the child care industry be destroyed. Families rely on it. It has got to be affordable. Uh, in the state of Connecticut, it's about between fifteen and eighteen thousand dollars per child. How many people can afford to do that? You know, and so we've got to make it affordable. It's got to be accessible. We have to pay wages to the child. We we entrust our most precious resources, our children, with. The, uh, the child care workers, and yet we are not willing to pay them uh, a, a livable wage. So big issues that you have brought to light. It's critical, uh, but I'm going to just say that the advocacy on your part is, uh, you, you know, uh, you need to continue that advocacy. Uh, but because it's, it's so palpable, it's there. There's so many examples all over the country of what's happened with child care. Uh, in, 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 in the United States. And we have to address it and address it in a, in a very substantial way. You know, I just, I'll just last note, my mother worked uh, in the old sweatshops in the city of New Haven, but I went to my grandmother's store, you know, and that was, was my childcare. The mm -hmm. fact of the matter is, is grandmothers, grandfathers, aunts, uncles, everyone is in the workforce. Those days are gone. Those days are, yeah. gone, and we need to have a very yes. uh, substantial child care system in the United States. Let me yield to the uh, ranking member. I don't know that I have much to add. I, <laughs> I think our witness uh, can understand how passionate our, our chair is about this and how knowledgeable. Uh, and um, uh, look, we, uh, uh, this is something she knows a great deal about. And uh, has uh, made sure our hearing is our, our committee has had robust hearings and discussion about uh, throughout her entire tenure uh, as uh, as chair, and uh, and then rose up and responded. Uh, I think uh, magnificently during the coronavirus crisis uh, when she understood what was happening to this industry and how critical it would be uh, to a recovery to have it up and operational help it through a difficult time. So uh, I, I, like the chair, don't know where we're going to end up. Um, if you've had the opportunity and since you were last, I'm sure you've, you've waited a long time. <laughs> right. you, you've gotten to hear uh, some of the requests that our chair and our, our subcommittee have to, to deal with, and they're pretty compelling. But uh, we really do take this seriously. We do try and uh, take care of the needs and, and do really as, as well as we possibly can with the resources that are entrusted to us by our, our colleagues. So uh, I don't think you need to worry that your voice won't be heard at the table. I, I think your voice is sitting at the head of the table. <laughs> but thank you so much for the work that you do. And thank you for taking the time to uh, testify. And thanks for uh, being so patient with us. This is a, an important day for us, a big day for us. And I'm Sorry, you were at the very end of the line, but again, thank you for, uh, you're not at the end of the line in terms of what this committee does. And, and thank you for being patient with us and allowing us to get through our other witnesses. So with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Uh, you know, listen, and again, I, I, I just, you know, we're, we are in sync and uh, uh, th thank you so much to the ranking member. Thank you so much, Nancy, and for, and for your, and for your uh, patience. This is, and it's a long, a long day, but as I said at the outset, as did the ranking member, 
we get so much out of this day with public witnesses. And there are a number of areas that, you know, are new information, you know, uh, for, for us. And that gives us, a, you know, the opportunity uh, to think about these areas when we're putting the bill uh, together. And I, I can, um, uh, I, I can commit this to you. I can't commit dollar amounts. Right? We just don't know where we are, but that there is a thoughtful process and one that incorporates, you know, the testimony of the people who testified here today. And uh, with that, I am going to call this hearing to a close. Hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Tom.